offices in the U.S., Europe, and Asia, Cooley advises entrepreneurs, investors, financial institutions, and established companies around the world where innovation meets the law. Hey, I'm Marjorie Egan. You're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH. We are broadcasting live. Uh, not on a Friday today, on a Thursday, that because correct, we're going to be Marjorie. joined by Mayor Wu in just a couple of minutes. But we are at the Boston Public Library. Good morning, Jim. Hey, how are you, Marjorie? Excellent. Uh, we have to uh, correct Henry Santoro, which is very painful for me, because Henry never makes a mistake. We are not, at the moment, joined live in studio by the mayor of Boston, Michelle Wu. She's going to be about 15 minutes late in person. But uh, I believe, uh, is she calling in? I'm not She's clear. She's calling in. We don't have her yet. We don't have her yet. She's going to be calling in for the first 10 or 15 minutes of this uh, discussion for Ask the Mayor, and then she will park her car or whatever they do, and then she'll I join don't us. Think, I don't think she has to park the car. Probably not. <laughs> join us in person in the studio. Sorry for the confusion. <laughs> By the way, if you have a question for the mayor, I would line up now. You can either do it on the phone at 877-301-8970. You can text her at the exact same number. Or you can tweet her at BOS uh, Public Radio. And by the way, if you're at the Boston Public Library and have a question for the mayor, our colleague Rebecca is somewhere. There she is right there. Come up to her, and we'll try to get to as many of your questions as we possibly can. Again, we will get Mayor Wu on the phone in a minute or two, and she'll be here in person in probably 15 or 20 minutes. Can we spend one minute and talk about the outrage of this Supreme Court? I don't know what case you want to pick, but I hope people understand because... Maybe it's a little in the weeds, regulatory authority. They took away the ability of the Environmental Protection Agency to protect the environment Correct. when it comes to coal-fired and gas-fired plants. And they basically said, well, let me read this great line from Harvard Law Professor Richard Lazarus, which was in a report by the great Nina Totenberg from NPR. By insisting that Congress, which is what they did, must specifically authorize significant rules at a time when the justices know the Congress is effectively dysfunctional, the court threatens to upend the national government's ability to safeguard the public health and welfare. The court, he added, is taking these dire steps at the very moment when the United States and all nations are facing our greatest environmental challenge of all, climate change. It is a complete and total well, it's middle a, it's, finger to the climate. Well, it's a tragedy because be, it's a tragedy as we're facing wildfires across the country, hurricanes that are even worse, temperatures that are through the roof, the pollution in lakes and 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 rivers and ocean. I mean, it's just a, it's a tragedy. It makes me it's 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 very sad. But I believe but, we are now. Well, but I just want to say we are. But just before we do that, a little bit later in the show, we're going to have an opportunity to talk about how this decision not only will affect the environment, uh, affect the environment nationally but it ha how it has potential to affect all regulatory yep. power by all federal yep. agencies and whether all that is thrown back to a dysfunctional Congress. But first, joining us on the phone, I think we're supposed to say happy inauguration day. Yes. <laughs> Mayor Wu, it's good to talk to you and happy belated inauguration day. Hello. It's, um, I don't know, at this point, it doesn't really feel... <laughs> <laughs> the right. full weight of the job makes inauguration hit a little differently. Yeah, well, before we get into the, uh, because you are uh, our, our, our green mayor, mayor well, before we get into the, uh, what's happened with the EPA and the Supreme Court, uh, tell us what is, this is your, your inauguration day, and you are planning some big events today, so tell us what's going on today. You're stuck in traffic, I guess that's starters, right? You're not, you're not here yet, Mayor Wu. <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry we're late. It's uh, okay. It has been quite a busy week, actually. Uh, this morning, we started out, as Henry said, bright and early at Tech Boston Academy, celebrating our new boss, incoming Boston School Superintendent, Mary Skipper. Uh, Superintendent Skipper then joined me as we headed over to the ribbon cutting for Walker Playground, our newest playground in Mattapan, in a coffee hour at the park. And so there were lots of conversations that, and um, fellow colleagues that wanted to say hello. So that, that uh, set me a little bit back in the schedule. And then after this, um, we'll be celebrating our official inauguration, just the summer block party on City Hall Plaza, showcasing some of the new features on the plaza as well, and the new chapter that our city government is in. You know, since you mentioned uh, uh, the, uh, the new superintendent-to-be, I guess come September, Skipper, uh, was she your choice, Mayor? Well, we know the school committee voted four to three, but was she your choice as well? I'm absolutely thrilled with 
where the school committee landed. Um, I'd said from the beginning that what I've seen visiting our schools and as a mom in the system and hearing from residents all across the city is that we really don't have any time to lose. And so we need someone who can hit the ground running, knowing our district, knowing our city, and knowing the job of being superintendent very well. And so Mary Skipper is uniquely qualified for this moment. She's worked at every level within DPS as a teacher, as a I was asking, would you have been equally thrilled to use your word if Tommy Welch had gotten the job? This is the school committee's decision. And so I had lots of conversations with folks and we have two, we had two very, very qualified okay. candidates, both of whom know the, the district and the city very well. We're talking to Mayor Michelle Wu. She's gonna be here at the Boston Public Library in just a few minutes. But before I leave the superintendent and take calls at 877-301-8970, you can also text us at that number and that will get through uh, to the, the mayor as well. As you know, there was some criticism. The Boston school system is, is a majority minority system. There were two other candidates of color that uh, that were not, uh, that, that dropped out. What happened to them? Do you, can you tell us a little bit about why they dropped out? Because as you know, um, uh, many parents and many educators think that it would have been more important to have a person of color heading the school system. Yeah, this is a unique process for choosing superintendent. And I'm understanding the way, the implications of, of how unique it is because we're also simultaneously working towards wrapping up our police commissioner and fire commissioner transitions as well. And the fact that this process by state law requires a public interview for all of the finalists in the job, that creates a different level of consideration for candidates before jumping into that final step, especially those who might be employed elsewhere or, or thinking about what that means for their intentions or, or um, aspirations to be so out there. And our search committee, which is, was incredible, uh, majority people of color representing organizations and stakeholders that have focused on our schools and ensuring that equity is at the center of, of how we serve our young people. At every stage of the search, they ensured that we had a representative, talented and qualified applicant pool. In fact, we got more applicants for this job than other cities have in simultaneous superintendent searches. And at the semi-finalist stage, at the finalist stage, we were thrilled with the options. There were four finalists chosen, um, representative of, of our communities and the diversity of our district. And then in the last 24 to 48 hours, two withdrew, two women of color withdrew for personal reasons. Did, were the personal reasons what you intimated a minute ago, Mayor Wu, that their names would be public and their word they'd be public and not get the job? Was that the reason? It, you know, it's, I don't want to ascribe, you know, to someone else's motivation, but we did have many, many conversations about would they uh, honor their commitment to be a finalist, would they stay in the process, and um, ultimately this is a very difficult job. It's probably one of the hardest jobs in the entire I'm city, sure. especially in this moment. There's so much that our schools uh, just need diligent focus on. And so I would never want to push someone into this job whose heart wasn't fully in it. And um, we had four extremely qualified, talented finalists. Um, and we had two who were willing to uh, go through that last step in the public interview. One last thing from me on the school issue. We had uh, the outgoing commissioner, uh, uh, Superintendent Caselius with us the other day, and we asked her about the question that Marjorie just broached to you about uh, no black or Latino finalist. And here's what uh, outgoing Superintendent Caselius had to say, Mayor. I do worry about all of those racial politics. If you didn't, then you really wouldn't be honest, right? I think that it's important, though, that they go in and ingratiate themselves with the community quickly and go in and talk about their vision and listen and talk with um, the, the, particularly the communities of color. Even assuming that superintendent to be Skipper is as highly qualified as you and the school committee say, do you worry about what, uh, as Caselius called it, the racial politics over this decision? In Boston, the racial disparities and the history of how our city often through direct government policy has deepened these disparities, that is just under the surface or at the surface of every issue we take up. 
and particularly when it comes to the Boston Public Schools. You know, I was uh, at the uh, performance of the, the new play on the, the book Common Ground mm. um, a little bit ago, uh, a week or two ago, and you see how familiar many of those conversations about where we are as a city with race and racial injustices and inequalities it, it, it's just still very familiar. And so, of course, racial equity is a baseline, a demonstrated progress and success in closing gaps and centering racial justice in, in their careers. That was a baseline qualification for any of our applicants in this role. We're talking with Boston Mayor Michelle Wu. She's going to be here in a few minutes. We have a, a texter who wants to know if you're late because you're stuck on the T, Mayor Wu. <laughs> you're, stuck on, you're not stuck on the T. You're in a car, I believe, correct? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, we had to get from Mattapan to the library. Yeah. So T would have been many, many, many buses. <laughs> okay, okay. We've got Kevin from Rhode Island on the phone. You're on with uh, Mayor Michelle Wu. Kevin, go ahead. How are you doing, Mayor? I, I just wanted to say first, um, Go ahead, I've, had Kevin. Nothing but great, I've had nothing but great experiences riding the T in the Boston subway, and I just I had heard along the way that you're planning on making the T free. Is this true? <laughs> in fact, we have already started on this endeavor. Um, the big picture is that we can't pretend as a public transportation should be treated differently from so many of the foundational public goods that we provide to residents, whether it's parks or schools or libraries. These are free because everyone benefits the more that they are used and shared. And public transportation is especially fundamental right now as we're trying to recover our economy from the pandemic, think about climate injustices, the disproportionate impact of pollution on communities of color and low-income neighborhoods, um, the, the need to shift people from gas-powered cars to public transportation and other options. And so it's frustrating that we're continuing to need to fight for service and access, but financial barriers should not be one of the barriers. And so on the three bus lines that Boston has removed fares for two years, We've continued to see a jump in ridership and in increased access and the benefits of that spilling over into every aspect of our community. Kevin, thanks for the call. Staying on the T for a second, I, I think I'm not telling tales out of school. Marjorie and I both think it's a great idea and the pilot is terrific. The T is a disaster, uh, not the free buses. The T, I mean, I don't have to uh, yeah. do the litany of things that have happened in just the last couple of weeks. There's a story by Shirley Leung about how business leaders have been working so hard to do what you want, which is bring a recovery to downtown or deeply concerned about the inability of their, their employees to depend upon a reliable service. One, what's your reaction to this nightmarish couple of weeks? And two, have you spoken to Governor Baker, who's been pretty silent about these things since the troubles started amassing? It's horrible. It's, it's, it's enraging. I mean, everything that we're doing, trying to build more affordable housing or empower our schools, bring jobs to Boston, it all relies on people being able to get around. Mm -hmm. And in a world-class city, we just simply can't have our major subway lines operating on weekend frequencies during the work week and, and during rush hour. Um, it's the results of decades of deferred maintenance and, and the broken down infrastructure that now is taking a lot more money and time to fix than it would have if we had just kept it funded and maintained along the way. And it's a result of more recent decisions as well in terms of how staffing levels have seen so much attrition and, and now we're, we're finding it hard to have the staff power to keep the trains uh, going on time. And so this is a constant topic of conversation. Uh, have you spoken to Governor State. Baker? Do you have confidence in Governor Baker's management of the tea? I have said repeatedly that the city of Boston should have a louder and more direct voice 
in how the tea is managed. For we need riders and commuters at the center of this. There is legislation uh, up at the state right now for Boston to have a more direct voice in the governance of the MBTA. And I had many uh, conversations with the governor over the years uh, about our differences <laughs> in, in how we see the, the system. We're, we're not, not laughing at yeah, you, not laughing we're laughing at, you. at the sound. It sounds like you might be swimming in the Charles yeah. at this particular juncture. But I don't want to change. Uh, do you have confidence in his? I mean, this has been. We are pulling up right now. So. Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> well, good. You can answer the confidence way. question. We'll take a break, and then that'll be the first one when you get back. We're going to take a brief break, Marjorie. That's good, because there was a lot going on in that car. The man Apparently was there was. <laughs> we can ask her about it. Okay, that. you're listening to Boston Public Radio. We are live today at the Boston Public Library. We'll be not be here tomorrow, but we're here today. Mayor Wu is going to join us in just a second. You're listening to 89.7 GBH. Support for our programs comes from you and Ocean State Job Lot, partnering with customers to provide backpacks to children throughout the Northeast. Learn more at OceanStateJobLot.com. That's OceanStateJobLot.com. And Boston Children's Hospital, ranked the nation's number one children's hospital by U.S. News and World Report, where families from Massachusetts and the world come for answers. BostonChildrens.org slash answers. And the South Shore Irish Heritage Trail. You can travel into the past through nine towns in Plymouth County. Learn more at ssirishtrail.org, funded by the Massachusetts Office of Travel and Tourism. And Legal Seafoods. You can visit their newly renovated location in Kendall Square, Cambridge. Now open Monday through Saturday for lunch and dinner. Reservations available at legalseafoods.com. If it isn't fresh, it isn't legal. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy, Marjorie, and live at the Boston Public Library, streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. Earlier I said we were joined live in the studio by Boston Mayor Michelle Wu. That was incorrect. It is correct now. And I'd like to say, since you only have 1,280 days left in your tenure, <laughs> I don't know if you're aware, that's why we decided to get you the table you requested earlier yeah, I've on. graduated Congratulations, to a stand table. I'm so excited. It's great to see you, Mayor. It's, it's very nice. So, so, Mayor Wu, Jim was asking you about the tea uh, when you, we took the break, when you got out of the car and came in here to the library, whether you had confidence in, in Governor Baker. And I think one of the things that was frustrating is after the feds came in and said there were so many problems, safety problems, staffing problems, training problems, problems, et cetera, with the T, the head of the T wouldn't, wouldn't identify any of those problems. It, it kind of seems like they're still operating with an awful lot of secrecy there. So do you think Governor Baker uh, it, c can deal with this? You know, problems that weren't created overnight won't be fixed overnight. But at the same time, there's been eight years now where we have had consistent advocacy. I don't know how many times I've been to the boardroom at the T to, to say this, this service is being cut back and that's going against everything that we need for our economy, our city, our future, or that fares are going up. And we just cannot have a system that is funded solely on the backs of riders. It would be as if for every seat in kindergarten, parents would have to figure out a way to pay or else you're on your own. Or coming into this beautiful library we wouldn't be able to pass on the full access to every single young person or community member who needed it. And so we, across the country, we need a different approach to how we think about the shared responsibility of investing in our system. Had we put in the money decades ago or even in the last eight years, we would be in a different place right now. We would have saved over the long run of, of what we have to do now to get everything 
back together and, and funded and fixed. Can we go from one uh, serious problem to one epic problem? But we talked at the top of the show about the latest Supreme Court disaster, uh, this one on the regulatory or lack of regulatory authority on the part of the EPA. Uh, the environmental mayor, Michelle Wu, uh, what's your reaction to this? And what does this mean in the world that you govern? It's, <laughs> it's just, um, it's been one gut punch after another coming after states with common sense gun laws, coming after women and all who are affected by reproductive justice and health, coming after our ability to have clean air and pass on the world that our kids deserve. Um, you know, in some ways, I hate to even frame it this way, but given where we are in the world, the decision is not as bad as this court could have made it. There's still a window open. It doesn't say that the agency will never have power to take some of these actions, but kind of forces the ball over to the to Congress's court to say, okay, give the legislative authority to this agency. But in the meantime, protections, hard fought protections now rolled back. And again, the responsibility kicked down to states and cities to step up. We are essentially back in the days of almost the Articles of Confederation, right? Where it's every state for themselves, whether women will have basic rights and bodily autonomy, whether we can have clean air in this immediate vicinity, even though all the other states' air also spills over to us. And um, Boston has been here before. We have always led the way in situations like this. Our leadership, we know, has the potential to change how other cities and states look at what's available to them as well, but it's just unnecessary coming from this federal government to go against the majority of the country in what people want. Um, and so we are, we are ready and determined to take it on at the local level. Our number, if you want to either text or call the mayor, is 877-301-8970. But one just uh, last thing about this before we get back to the calls and the text is that we have all these deadlines that we're supposed to be meeting it, to ward off absolute climate catastrophe. And I don't know how the United States in the next few years can meet those if coal plants are going to be able to continue to pollute the air and all those other uh, sources of pollution that the EPA was able to regulate. It, I mean, it almost seems that's it, that it's, it's done. So I will say that this sense of you're on your own at the state and local level is uh, quite disempowering. Um, it's it's anti-American compared to where we've come from of, of banding together and ensuring that we're thinking about our collective rights and what the baseline is across this country. Um, but at the same time, so many of the impacts and the changes that we need to enact, if every city just moved on their own or or even a collection of the largest cities did it together, that would get us most of the way there. Right? Cities are where there's density in where people live, in where we see transportation emissions, in where we see building emissions. And so for Boston, more th about three quarters of our emissions come from the buildings, and most of that coming from large buildings. And so if we can just keep going with the reforms that we've already passed around the building emissions reduction ordinance, the ability to monitor and push and set standards for new development and then retrofit and support residential retrofits for energy efficiency, we will be able to show that not only can we have an immediate impact, but it is, it is the fiscally responsible decision anyway. And so that, that's in some ways what's most mind-boggling about all of this is that when you take the steps towards environmental and climate protections, you save money over the long run. You make everyone healthier very immediately. And you create jobs in the process. So this is where we need to head. The federal government will get here eventually, but we need to be ready. We'll be shovel ready or the equivalent of shovel ready for all of our projects, and uh, Boston will, will lead the way. Our number is 877-301-8970. It's Boston Mayor Michelle with it, Wu with us for the hour. Michael from West Roxbury, welcome to the show. You're on with the mayor. Hi, Mayor Wu. Uh, this is Michael Guire from Boston Latin Academy. I saw you Tuesday in Malden, and I saw you this morning at Tech Boston Academy, so thank you for all the work you're doing for us. My question for you now is, as you can probably imagine, 
Uh, the teachers need a contract. Boston Teachers Union have been without a contract this past year, and I was wondering when we can get that settled. So our Latin teacher, Michael, is giving me um, three hours after the start of the, the first day in which we have a new superintendent named to, to get right to work. Um, thank you for your leadership, uh, Mr. McGuire. I had the chance to actually sit with Mr. McGuire for lunch at one of our school cafeterias several years ago. And so um, his advocacy and leadership has already made such a difference. We're in a new food contract responding to some of the issues we identified back then. And we are eager to make sure that our educators have the supports, the contractual language, the benefits that they deserve, especially after the hardest three years that, that any school system has gone through. And so we're in active negotiations. I am committed to getting this done. I, now I have an extra partner with our new superintendent ready to go as well. And so um, we will make sure that that has been a priority. And now there's a little more breathing room to be able to spend the time and get it done. But does that mean it couldn't get done until at least September because she's not on board until September? No, we've, the goal was to try to make as much progress as possible. And even in this uh, period of time, Superintendent Skipper will, will be starting to onboard in a kind of phase in, okay. phase out way, as she says. And in the and anyway, we have an incredible acting superintendent in place, Dr. Drew Eccleston. So we, we have plenty of folks uh, to work on this. And now that the search is done, uh, we have plenty more time to get to work too. Michael, thanks for your call. We appreciate it. You know, it. Michael just mentioned seeing you at, at uh, Tech Boston Academy. And I, I think he mentioned that because the new superintendent used to run uh, Boston Tech Academy. And in fact, Barack Obama gave Boston, uh, Tech Boston, excuse me, Tech Boston Academy that big award about um, being a very successful school. So there's a lot of criticism of the schools, but obviously they, she did great things at that school. There are great things happening all across our district. And sometimes it's at the classroom level, sometimes it's at the school level, sometimes it's at the, the district level. Um, we often, we need to do a better job, and I, I say city government, and I will take accountability for elevating those stories and highlighting what is happening but our school leaders and educators are working every day with incredible students and they just need the clear communication, the supports and the resources to, to really scale what's happening already. You know, Mayor Wu, and by the way, if you want to talk to her or text her, it's 877-301-8970. You mentioned earlier when you were talking about the search that resulted in the hiring of soon to be new superintendent Skipper last night, the police commissioner thing. I'm going to channel Marjorie Egan who almost every month gets in an argument or a discussion with Paul Revel, former Secretary of Education, about how outrageous it is. Tell me if I'm wrong, that the school search is public. She understands community involvement, but she's concerned that there are people who'd be wildly qualified who won't apply because they're worried that they don't get the job, as we discussed before. So that's the law. The law does not require you to be, uh, disclose the names of police commissioners, but it would seem to me What's good for the goose, as they say, I'm is sensing good. a trap. Well, it is a trap. <laughs> uh, because even if it's not, you're not one who, this is a compliment, not a criticism, who relies purely on what's legally mandated. If it turns out it's good for the community, according to statute, that they know who the finalists are for a school committee, it's at least as important for them to know who you and your committee are interviewing for, to be the police commissioner. Is it not? Am I, am I wrong? There are challenges with the very public process, just as there's challenges with a more um, confidential process. And I don't, if, I, if we were writing these laws from scratch, I agree with Marjorie that I don't know why we would necessarily have only one of these two processes go in a certain way and, and not the other. Should they both um, be public if you're writing the law or they both be secret? So to be honest, I don't, you know, I think it was, it's, I think it's really important that um, our school communities and our larger city feel connected to the superintendent and recognize that building community trust is the most important resource that we have. Having gone through this now once um, in, in this role, I don't know that the process as currently structured is even the most impactful for building community trust. It's one eight hour <laughs> session with each candidate, and then um, it, you know, there's not, it's not clear what other, how different things are being weighted and this and that, and so we are working with the parameters that we have under each of these processes. We're actually quite close on our uh, police commissioner side, and uh, because those candidates 
entered that process with the understanding and expectation of confidential sure. confidentiality throughout, uh, I will honor that. And uh, many of them are tied to different situations where it would be quite complicated to be um, involved in a different How process. How close are you? You say it's close. How close? When, when We're you close. When, when do you expect to make an announcement? Um, I, I hope very, very soon. I had hoped for late spring, early summer, so now I'm, I just, I really don't like being late on my deadlines, um, but we're, we're almost there. But uh, you didn't answer the question, if I may, about you said if I were in charge or something, if I could make a decision, if you could make a decision about these hiring processes, B, where at the end you just announce who the successful candidate is, or you open everything up if everything was equal, which would you prefer? Well, let me get through the police process, and then we can actually evaluate both retroactively with the same okay. views. I think I'm, I see the pros and cons of doing the fully public process. I think we've yet to see how that plays out on the police side. And um, with both processes, the goal was to create a starting point that was entirely based on public response and feedback. And so both search committees embarked with many, many listening sessions, town halls, stakeholder meetings, and in more private settings as well to come up with the job description exactly based on what the residents of Boston wanted to see in these roles. And that, I know, made a big difference in the school superintendent search, and um, it has exactly shaped our police commissioner search as well. Uh, Mayor Wu, Tony from Jamaica Plain is concerned about voter intimidation. Uh, the reports of right-wing Republicans training to be poll workers and poll watchers. Uh, he believes there'll be massive voter intimidation at the polls, wants to know what Boston is doing to prevent voter intimidation. I think we see the impacts of the tone and tenor of federal, uh, of nationalized politics and the rise of hate and harassment and abuse spilling over to our local politics every day um, at our doorsteps. And um, this is something that we all need to be girding for. So I don't, I don't have the uh, specific plan right now, but with Tony's reminder and push, I'll come back next time. Can ready. we turn to an upbeat thing for a second? I am, there's nothing I love more than closed streets for human beings to have fun on. I think the thing you did over on Dartmouth Street for, was it 10 days that yeah. it was? Was beyond fabulous. Marjorie, of course, is complaining that it caused her to take more time to That's get home. That's right. Uh, <laughs> one, what's the evaluation process that you're going through to decide if that was a success and you want to do more? Two, when is Newbury Street going to be closed? And I know JP and Roxbury and Dorchester have July, August, and September dates, which we'll give in a minute. So give us an update on the Dartmouth Review and Newbury Street, if you will. Yeah, just a huge shout out to our streets team and the Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics and all those involved in the placemaking efforts. Um, it was not only a, an action to close down the street to vehicular traffic and allow for pedestrians and anyone just to be out and enjoy and therefore kind of really extend the whole of Copley Square from the library all the way over to the church. Um, it was also programming. There were diagrams to, so, to solicit feedback on other changes around the city. And there was a, there, I don't know if you noticed, Jim, when you were out there, but there was a uh, map up on one part that showed, in fact, that Copley Square used to have several major roads running through it, right? Huntington used to cut all the way through. And at one point in our history, people decided that by creating, giving that space over to people as opposed to just vehicular traffic, we could create that treasure that we have today in Copley Square. And so just a reminder that uh, these decisions have been before us in the past and that generations later will rely on us to, to think it through. Um, we were measuring the impact on traffic in the surrounding area. So some of the, those results are still being compiled as well as the participation and engagement. Mm -hmm. um, so I, there will be a more formal presentation. Newberry Street, I don't have the exact opening dates, but we in intend to start it. Um, let's see, is it July? No, it's not. We intend to start it next month um, and have it start earlier and go for longer than it has in the past, several, several weekend days. Um, and you're right, it, it's going to be Center Street in Jamaica Plain. July 10th. In July, July 10th. And then um, Blue Hill Ave. Grove Hall, uh, Warren Blue Hill on August 6th. Blue Hill and Ave. Dorchester Ave on September And then Dodd Ave yep. for almost the entirety of the uh, parade route, yeah. really two miles. It. And so we encourage everyone to come out. These are in some ways tests for us. There's mm -hmm. a whole lot of coordination that goes into that from 
rerouting the plans for emergency vehicles and ensuring that every point along the route is still safe and accessible for our emergency vehicles to planning for how traffic will be rerouted in the area. So we're taking it one, at a, one month at a time to test it out, measure, and then hopefully expand from there. Let's do a scientific survey. How many people in the audience here support the closing of streets so we can be like human beings oh, with each other? Go. And how, ma go. how many oppose it? <laughs> Nobody. Thank you very much. Okay. Like oh, there's speaking, your science. Leading speaking question. Of, but what? Speaking of the audience, yeah. uh, we have uh, our, our colleague Rebecca is up oh, there. Oh, yes, she is. And if you want to have a question for the mayor, you're welcome to come up to the microphone by Rebecca's seat and ask a question. Or you're also welcome to call us at Texas at 877-301-8970. The mayor will be with us till the top of the hour. Uh, we have a question from uh, about uh, school shootings. Um, wondering from uh, 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 Adson and Woburn, what the city is doing with this most recent spate of shootings, including, of course, the horrible school shooting in Uvalde. Yeah. Um, just as a, as a mom, it's devastating to even think about the possibility, much less the reality of, of this happening around the country. Um, in Boston, we are prepared for the worst, but determined that it will never come to that. Um, our Public safety agencies and school uh, infrastructure have clear protocols, and in fact, not, not too long ago, uh, the police department was running a uh, simulation, a tabletop exercise without anyone in person in our neighborhoods, but just to ensure that the channels of communication were kind of run through and, and clear and, and uh, well-practiced. Um, we have the lowest incidence of uh, having violent incidents uh, it, uh, uh, relative to the rest of the country are some of the most protective um, gun laws here. And so I don't want anyone to feel like uh, Massachusetts is, is not taking the stands that, that we need to take for the protection of our young people. We're doing everything we can. And at the end of the day, it is about directing resources to, for the health mental health, well-being, and opportunity of all of our community members. You know, you mentioned being, being a mother. I've often thought this wasn't going on when my kids were, uh, were in school. Um, but active shooter drills is a tough thing for children, I, I, I think, to, to go through to prepare for that. How do you feel about those? Yeah, our, our philosophy in the Boston Public Schools is to ensure that staff are well-trained, but um, we have not been running through active shooter drills with the students. Um, I, I start, you know, I, I was, uh, at the Wilbur with Dr. Ibram Kendi a few days ago, uh, in, in, with a book talk on his new book, How to Raise an Anti-Racist, and it really, the book really challenged me to think through my own parenting styles because one core piece of, of his view and the research shows that, in fact, when we strive to protect our children from protect their innocence and not talk about issues or not raise things, they're still absorbing, they're still learning, and maybe they're coming up with different conclusions than they otherwise would, or they don't have the fluency and the language to grapple with that. And my kids are four and seven. Um, we have not yet talked about such a possibility occurring in real life in, in other parts of the, the country. And so, um, you know, with our new superintendent, I'm sure this will be a topic of, of discussion on how best to prepare and what is appropriate for our young people at what ages. As part of the state's agreement, school safety is a big piece of what we'll be doing even in the time before September and, and the start of the next school year with a full audit of how all of our public age safety agencies and public health agencies work together within the school system and um, being prepared for every situation. By the way, so, so the parents don't feel guilty. I had Ibram Kendi on TV with me the other night. He is remarkably transparent. He admits that he attempted to shield his kid, I think her name is Imani, early on until he had an epiphany that that was not the way to raise a kid in a racist society. Judith in Dorchester, you're on with the mayor of Boston, Michelle Wu. Hey. Um, hello. Hi. Uh, mayor, Michelle Wu, Boston Public Schools. Yes, I would like the mayor um, to talk about her plans for expanding and improving technical vocational education in Boston now that we have a new superintendent. Great. Bad connection, but she gets the question. Thank yeah. you, Judith. Hi, Miss Judith, and I know this exact Miss Judith oh, great. Uh, from, from many, many conversations at Madison Park. Thank you for your leadership and being so uh, closely intertwined with 
with vocational and technical education in our school system. I will, I will say uh, to Ms. Judith here that I had the chance in parallel as the, school, as the search committee was interviewing semi-finalists, I think there were seven or eight at that stage, uh, to have just a few minutes so I could quickly meet and say hello as well and ask a few questions. Every single candidate I asked, what will you do with Madison Park, what will you do to support our community members and the friends group and the alumni group there? And so um, had been very impressed by Superintendent Skipper's answers to that question. She is ready to go here as well. And so we know there's a lot ahead, um, but that the community has already laid out a clear number of next steps from things to take care of on the facility side to the um, programs that are offered to the admissions policy and so uh, eager to have a partner now to, to support your work. Thank you so much for the call. You know, I should say, while the mayor is with us till just before the hour, top of the hour, uh, ordinarily we'd have the news at 12 o'clock. We should have told you instead of the news with Henry, we're going to bring you live the swearing in of uh, soon to be justice, Katanji Brown Jackson. So please stick around. Can I, you know, the other night I have to apologize. I was on TV trashing the legislature for not acting like this on these, uh, the executive orders from Governor Baker around in the wake of the Dobbs and the, the Roe overturning. And in fact, the House has already acted in a comprehensive way. However, when I read the story about liquor licenses, oh, which we've yeah. talked on we've, with Ayanna Presley when she was a city councilor and you and others, could you describe the current situation? The, the, first of all, the story mentions that if you're in a predominantly white neighborhood, no problem on liquor license front. If you're a predominantly uh, person of color neighborhood, forget about it. And then you read, and I always forget, the people who decide that. You can't blame you. You got The legislature has control over liquor licenses still in the city of Boston. Is that outrageous? What is the justification for that in 2022, Mayor? So these, these, uh, the setup dates back to the uh, times when Boston's then more Irish mayors were uh, discriminated against by a more sort of Brahmin legislature. And so there were many ways That's in right. which the controls that the state legislature added onto the city, cities in Massachusetts are much more um, expansive and... Uh, suffocating <laughs> than Thank other you. states around the country. And so we have a tremendous number of items that within our home rule authority as a city for the changes that only affect those within our city borders, we still have to go to the state for um, additional conversations. And you know, I, I welcome any conversation with the state. We have some great partners up there. And for me, it's always been a chance to talk about all of the issues that, that need addressing, and it, it's definitely a two-way partnership. We will make it work, whatever system there is, but on liquor licenses, it means that there is a cap set by state law on the city of Boston, and it's currently a transferable system, meaning whenever someone obtains a license, when they are going to close a restaurant or, or get out of the business, they don't have, the uh, license doesn't automatically go back to the city or the, the state in this case, but they can sell it to the next person. So then there's an additional private market for these licenses because it's basically a government monopoly and the, the supply is, is artificially low. That means that the licenses themselves can cost upwards of $400,000, nearly, nearly half a million dollars. Um, the city and the, the taxpayers only get a couple thousand of that as the actual permit fee, but the rest is changing hands. And because we have a whole system that has grown up this way, many restaurant owners have invested $500,000 of their own money, and so to say, poof, you know, we're changing it, does have direct impacts as well. There are, there are systems that could, for example, buy back licenses over time, or uh, what some economists call reverse auction them over time, and, and should sort of try to change it. And in fact, the disparities come not because the licenses are limited by geography, but actually opposite of that, that because licenses can go anywhere and there's a private market, when a restaurant in Roxbury, for example, that has a liquor license closes down, they can sell and then the, their, their license and it gets bid up and often it, the license will then get taken to the seaport where you can sustain much higher prices for the food and, and this and that. And um, then we've seen the slow migration of licenses out of neighborhoods of color. And so, in fact, uh, the city council has proposed, Councilor Worrell uh, has proposed a system that would create 
kind of a compromise of geographic neighborhood restricted licenses, particularly in communities of color, that would be non-transferable. They would revert back to the state. Would the state have to state approve that? that? The state has to approve Were you that. good in moot court, I assume? You no, were, I right? Ne I never, I was too busy <laughs> during law give, school. I know you don't want to offend the legislature. Can you give me one argument as to why the legislature should have anything to do with what you and the city council decide is best for the restaurants of Boston, even one, or, what's the argument? So the argument is that because the system was created this way, there are significant impacts from undoing this. And of course our um, legislators are just as invested in our communities. Um, I think again, if we were starting from scratch, it wouldn't end up this way, but we are here and it's a little bit of a difficult knot to okay. untangle. Fair enough. You know, it, uh, the reporter who wrote about this in the Globe, good Irish name, Danny McDonald, you <laughs> talked about it was a Brahmin, Protestant, Irish thing. The way he put it, uh, this, this law it was from an antiquated vestige of an era when Protestant state legislators feared if left to their own devices, the Irish Catholic leaders in Boston would flood the city with whiskey. <laughs> so I just love the way he put that. I, you just can't trust them as far as they can, they can throw them. Here's, a, here's from Hillary in Jamaica Plain, Mayor Wu. Good morning. Does the mayor have any plans to install any geo-grid pilot programs for geothermal heating and cooling of buildings as is being done in other parts of the Commonwealth? So fascinatingly enough, if you are driving along um, Soro Drive or even Mem Drive, um, and you look along the river, that sort of funny building that looks like a stack of books yeah. is the BU Data Sciences yes. building, um, almost done, I think. And underneath that building, if you look at the height of that, I forget how many stories, 14, 15 stories high building, um, there is a geothermal well two times, more than two times the height of that building going down into the ground. Oh. And so that building is going to be entirely um, net zero and is one of the first major examples of, it's quite complicated in Boston, there are lots of groundwater issues and, and uh, all sorts of coordination, but we have one example of a uh, soon to be major institution taking this on and looking at other ways that we can start to pilot in different places Neat. across the city. Neat. You know, we're over, there's so many texts, so I'm going to stay with them for a minute. Jane in the South End says, uh, Mayor Wu, could you give us an update on where we are helping people living at uh, Mass and Cass, and also at the same time respond to the criticism the some people led by Congressman Lynch, who are arguing a sweep is the appropriate thing to be doing right now. Yeah, um, I think it's, it's important to be clear about what the different challenges are in the Mass and Cass, Melania Cass and Mass Ave uh, intersection and, and surrounding area in different seasons, right? So this time last year, that area already had hundreds of tents popping up, which over the course of that summer became very fortified structures, right? Residents living at the overlap of homelessness and substance use and mental health challenges with nowhere else to get services and feeling like this was the best shot at community and, and life and, and support, um, there's a tremendous amount of danger that comes from having a community living in tents on the street with no running water and especially as the weather gets cold. And so our actions this past January to really run a housing surge, create over 150 new units of housing, and since then we've placed about 180 individuals as those for initially placed have transitioned into permanent housing as well, to be able to connect everyone there to wraparound services, low threshold housing, and then remove all of the tents. Every single day, our teams are out there taking down more tents. And so in some ways, the sort of goal for this summer is to end in a very different place than last summer as the baseline. The next goal is to ensure that we are connecting people with services and trying to transform the area. There have been a lot of efforts around street beautification. You'll see teams of uh, residents who often were formerly living in the encampments or continue to be living with this set of um, diagnoses working and in partnership with the local business improvement district, um, hired and, and earning income, taking on the beautification of that area. We've also stood up a free shuttle service, connecting people to local service providers. We, the numbers so far, about three dozen or so people a day are actively 
getting on the shuttles and, and getting treatment or services elsewhere. We've made some tweaks to the engagement center, and there's now a whole team coordinating those resources led by um, Tanya Del Rio, director of our co coordinated response team, and really ensuring that the Boston Public Health Commission, police department, the uh, public works department, and everyone in between are working together. Mayor Wu, we're heading into July. I wonder if, well, you get to take, if you get to take vacation when you're the mayor of Boston, or do you have to be on the job every day this summer? <laughs> With a young family, um, vacation is sort of a questionable term anyway of how much rest <laughs> you get, even if you are physically somewhere else. Uh, but our family tradition, which started um, when my mom was first struggling and my sisters were kind of moving in with me, was we took a couple days and just, I think it was two nights at first and went up to Acadia oh. National Park, fell in love with it. And so every year my sisters and our kind of extended family have gone. We did not go last year during the mayoral campaign because that was too intense, um, but we we're going to sneak away and find some time there. And, Great. and our summer usually is enjoying all the incredible parks and events across the city. I knew it. Big, big 4th of July <laughs> celebration coming up. Uh, we just cut the ribbon on Walker Playground in Mattapan. Beautiful, lots of new water features everywhere. So we go on a little tour as our vacation around the city too. Okay, so 11 to 3 today was your block party inauguration. Do you think the remaining three hours can possibly as be as much fun as the first hour was, Mayor Wu? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't fun. get much better than this, does it? Yeah. This is always fun. I always look forward to it. I am, um, you know, we should have broadcasted it live from the block party. We uh, actually that's should. right. Is that where that's you're headed right. now, that's by right. the way, if people are interested? So you'll be at your yes. own block party. City Hall Plaza. See us there. A celebration of summer. There's stations great. for the kids and all sorts of activities. So we walk up free and open to all. And a great day for it. You know, by the way, starting in the fall, we are going to go out on location to do the show. We should talk to your office about Perfect. doing something collaboratively with you. Mayor Wu, we really appreciate you getting here. And thanks for calling in in the beginning with Mayor Michelle Wu. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you very much for being here, Mayor Wu. We much appreciate it. That, of course, was Boston Mayor Michelle Wu. We thank her, as always, for her time. Coming up, we'll be joined by former Suff uh, Suffolk County District Attorney, oops, former Suffolk County Sheriff, Andrew Cabral. And we're also going to bring you the live swearing in of Katanji Brown Jackson to the United States Supreme Court. That's just in a couple of minutes. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. And we are broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library. Listening to Boston Public Radio with Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan. Just ahead, more smart conversation about what's going on in our community. That's right after an NPR news break here on GBH News 897. Support for GBH comes from you and Picasso, real estate co ownership that helps people buy and own a second home. Picasso brings buyers together to co own a property in an LLC, then provides ongoing management. Listings at PACASO.com. Discover how North Adams, Massachusetts, transitioned from a small town in economic collapse to become part of the global art world in just a few decades. Don't miss Museum Town, tonight at 9 on GBH2. I'm Jen White, host of 1A, and this is 89.7 WGBH, WGBH HD1 Boston, online at gbhnews.org. Boston's local NPR. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. We are broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library. We're usually here Fridays, but we're here Thursdays. Special day because we're going to be, uh, to because we were just talking to the mayor and some other reasons. Anyway, and we will not be here tomorrow, we should say, so be, don't come to the library. We will not be here tomorrow. So can I tell you what's going on there? We're going to try yes. to do a juggling act. In a second, we're going to start speaking to Andrea Cabral. We'll probably have to break into that because the scheduled swearing in of Katanji Brown Jackson uh, is right now, actually. And just to tell you, it's a private ceremony at the Supreme Court. The man shall be succeeding Stephen Breyer from Cambridge, who stepped down at noon. He will administer what is called the judicial oath. I don't know what that is, but he's doing it. 
And Chief Justice Roberts will administer what is called the constitutional oath, and she'll be immediately a member of the court, able to hear things like emergency petitions, et cetera, again. So that is imminent. We don't know when, but any minute. Uh, and in the interim, we're, we are joined by Suffolk County, former Suffolk County Sheriff, former Secretary of Public Safety. That would be, whoops, is it happening? No, it's not happening. It will be happening in a second. Andrea Cabral, hello, Andrea, how are you? How are you? Excellent. You know, Andrew, not excellent. Andrea Cabral, I, I, I know it's probably the dream of lots of people when they get out of law school, maybe someday they can reach to the heights and get on the United States Supreme Court. But I can't help thinking, it's, Ketanji Brown Jackson has got to have some mixed reaction joining this court in this hot mess kind of moment. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a, a, probably a very accurate, mixed is probably a very accurate way to phrase it. I mean, if, if you aspire to the bench at all, but most particularly if you aspire to the, um, the, hot, the bench at the highest you know, court the nation has, it's because you, you believe that you will make a difference. You're going to hear um, cases that are hugely consequential and you're going to be part of, uh, you know, uh, a, a a group of nine that has the final, literally the final say, but for what Congress may or may not do on the law of the land. And so, you, you know, that's exciting. The, the opportunity to bring everything you are and your life experience to decisions that affect people's everyday lives is very exciting. On the other hand, um, it, it probably feels discouraging because, um, there it doesn't seem to be much that could sway this court from the path that it is on. So your ability to have an impact, your ability to persuade, influence your colleagues, be, have your opinions respected by them, listened to by them. Yeah, I would say that, you know, that's, that probably is factoring into, um, you know, her reaction and that, you know, in some cases, maybe not emergency petitions and various other things, but in full opinions of the court, you are, you come into it outnumbered. And I don't know, you know, how many other judges have really sort of faced that in the history of the Supreme Court. There's an unconfirmed report that she was offered either to be waterboarded this morning or sworn into the Supreme Court, and she had to take time before she decided. You know, we're gonna talk at great length with a climate reporter for the Globe, David Abel, about this outrageous uh, EPA decision this morning. We've talked about Roe, we've talked about guns. You know, some of the, quote, lesser decisions are not lesser, but just don't get uh, this kind of attention. This Louisiana redistricting case, just to spend a minute on, is a, is a double middle finger to what's left of the Voting Rights Act. Could you give a quick summary, and again, we may have to uh, interrupt you in a second, but give us a quick summary of what the court decided in this Louisiana case, Andrea, please. So, you know, if there's a, there's very rarely a good news, bad news, uh, you know, uh, thing with the court, but the, if there's any good news, it's that what they have decided to do is, uh, you know, allow the redistricting map to stay in place um, since the injunction was overturned by a lower court, but they haven't made a final decision on that map and I think uh, uh, an Alabama or Georgia mm -hmm. map. They have another case that's, that's already before them and they're essentially of taking, taking this Louisiana case uh, and joining it. But the, but the map was rejected, um, that the, the map that the Republicans drew was rejected by the lower court because uh, black people in Louisiana make up a third of the voting population and the Republicans had gerrymandered uh, nearly all of those voters into a single district. And, and the opponents of that map were saying, you know, at, there, there needs to be at least one other district that's, you know, majority. Uh, so uh, that their representation in Congress equals their representation. Andrea, I have to interrupt you because we were sure. told that uh, uh, the swearing in Judge of Ketanji Brown Jackson, Jackson is about to st start imminently. Chief Justice Roberts is in the picture, standing a few feet so away from right his soon to be colleague, Ketanji Brown Jackson. We were told that Stephen Breyer would do the initial swearing in, that uh, judicial one, again, which I don't quite understand. But uh, uh, here it is, we're gonna throw to, so I guess some comments from Chief Justice Roberts before the actual swearing in. So we'll be delivering two oaths. I'll deliver the constitutional oath, uh, and uh, Justice Breyer uh, will administer the um, 
uh, statutory oath. There will be a formal investiture. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Katanji Brown Jackson, do solemnly swear. I, Katanji Brown Jackson, do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely without that, any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. That I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I'm about to enter and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I am about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you very much. And now I'll turn things over to Justice Breyer. Good. The judicial oath, will you raise your right hand, please? Thank you. I, Ketanji Brown Jackson. I, Ketanji Brown Jackson. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will administer justice that I will administer justice without respect to persons. Without respect to persons. And do equal right. And do equal right to the poor and to the rich. To the poor and to the rich. And that I will faithfully and impartially. And that I will faithfully and impartially discharge and perform. Discharge and perform all the duties. All the duties incumbent upon me. Incumbent upon me. As an associate justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. As an associate justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. Under the Constitution. Under the Constitution. And laws of the United States. And laws of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. And now on behalf of all of the members of the court, I am pleased to welcome Justice Jackson to the court and to our common calling. I'm not sure if uh, the new justice, no, she's not going to speak. You know, one of the things, can we bring Andrew Carell back into this uh, conversation? And if Ju Justice Jackson speaks, which I don't think she's going to do, we will, of course, bring that to you. You know, Andrea, one thing I hope is there's so much crap going on in this country right now. I hope people don't lose focus or sight of the fact that a major part of history of this country was just made 30 seconds ago after a couple hundred years of the Supreme Court, no? No, I think that's absolutely right, Jim. And a couple of points I wanna make about her swearing in. The first of which is, and this is something that I, um, I sort of tweeted uh, you know, a few days ago, that uh, upon Breyer's departure, there will be three women, a black woman, a Puerto Rican woman, and a Jewish woman who will literally become the faces of democracy on the nation's highest court. And there's something that is both apt about that, given their, their lived experiences, but also very sad that the other members of the court, the same cannot be said about the other members of mm. the court. And what I tweeted was how, how overwhelmed with gratitude and pride I am at the, at my, you know, I'm secure in the knowledge that they will fight as hard for to uphold the spirit of the Constitution as well as its letter um, a, as any justice ever could. But I'm very sad that, they go, that they're going to have to fight as hard as they are and that they're outnumbered, which is why the court should be expanded. The other thing is, as I'm listening to the uh, oath, um, which I don't know if I've ever paid that really close attention Me to, neither. both statutory and the constitutional one. All I could think of was for the, for the justices that lied about their position on Roe versus Wade as precedent and for the justices who are readily signing on to decisions that do favor individual persons or special interests, the decisions that do show partiality, there's, there's a good argument to be made that they are breaking their oaths one decision at a time as well. 
We're talking yeah. to Andrea Cabral mm -hmm. immediately after the swearing in of Kathanji you know, Brown Jackson. I'm not sure if they're administering justice as the oath said either to equal right to the poor and to the rich. I'm not I'm not sure if they're carrying that out either. And I just couldn't help but thinking how how sad it is that a, a lot of us had faith as we lost faith in Congress, as we lost faith in uh, other leaders, that you think, well, you know, the Supreme Court, you know, they, they, they can rise above. And I keep, I looked at Justice Roberts, who talked about the court having the respect of the public and the faith of the public. He was supposed to be the person that was so worried about that and how the respect and justice, uh, respect of the court has diminished dramatically. Lowest, lowest confidence levels and in the Gallup polls yeah. in the history of he's, polling he's right now. He's failed completely in that and endeavor. That, that's terrifying for an institution like the SCOTUS to have reached, to have plummeted in the opinion of the public regardless of reason. The other thing I'll just add here before we move off of this topic is that um, in addition to making this incredible history after how many centuries, there's finally a, you know, a black woman on the uh, Supreme Court of the United States. She and Clarence Thomas are both uh, married to people of other races. Mm. And Thomas laid it out in uh, Dobbs about thinking that you know, all of these other rights that they don't believe uh, you know, flow naturally from uh, the Constitution he left out loving versus he Virginia. did, but that's gonna that's gonna be part of it. If there, if the attack comes and it will on on equal marriage, and on uh, contraception. Uh, contraception, all of those things. Loving versus Virginia is is right there with all the rest of them. It'll be very interesting to see what judges at different ends of the spectrum um, <laughs> have to say when that right is challenged as well. You know, we can tell that Andrea is warming to her role as Phil and host. Did you hear what she just said when she answered? Before we move to the next topic, we decide when we move to the next topic, yeah. not you. Okay. Hey, Andrea, can we move to the next topic? The January 6th hearing, obviously everybody yeah. was gripped by uh, uh, the witness uh, the other day. We don't want to talk about the big picture testimony. I want to talk about something you know a lot about as a former prosecutor. Here is Liz Cheney at the end of the hearing two days ago raising concerns about witness tampering. Uh, uh, and what you're about to hear is her voice, meaning uh, Congresswoman Cheney, reading the accounts uh, that they, the committee received from two separate witnesses. Here it is. Well, what they said to me is as long as I continue to be a team player, they know I'm on the right team. I'm doing the right thing. I'm protecting who I need to protect. You know I'll continue to stay in good graces in Trump world. And they have reminded me a couple of times that Trump does read transcripts. And just keep that in mind as I proceed through my interviews with the committee. Here's another sample in a different context. This is a call received by one of our witnesses. Quote, a person let me know you have your deposition tomorrow. He wants me to let you know he's thinking about you. He knows you're loyal, and you're going to do the right thing when you go in for your deposition. And by the way, there are some reports that one of those two threats was actually made to Ms. Hutchinson. Uh, right. We don't know that for sure. Uh, you used to be, again, in the prosecutorial business. This is mob kind of behavior, no? It absolutely is. I, I mean, I've thought for, for years now that uh, the ultimate indictment of Trump should be a RICO indictment, a racketeering indictment, and I'm very serious about that. I know you that. are, I know you are. Proven. I think it can, racketeering can actually be proven here. But what he's doing and what people are doing on his behalf here is no different than what he did as a private citizen. And, and, and this is part of what I think, I think people think that if you get elected to an office, you, you, it, it immediately changes you. Like Michelle Obama said, it doesn't change you. It reveals more of you yeah. because you have more power to That's abuse. True. And if you're someone like Trump, you will abuse power to the, at the level at which it is given you. And he did this with private lawsuits. He did this when he would, you know, he, when he threatened people who might testify against him um, uh, in any sort of legal action. Michael Cohen, um, you know, 
who ironically has a podcast called Mia Culpa. His Michael Cohen's his former lawyer. I didn't know that. Talk, yeah, that is great. He about all the time, and he said it when he testified in front of Congress. He said two things that were very important: there will be no peaceful transition of power if he loses, and all and the kinds of things that he's uh, you know being impeached for and and uh, and being investigated for. These are the things I did for him as his private attorney. This is what he does. He is a mobster. He, he thinks and speaks and acts like a mobster, and he does all of the things that a mobster does. And it's absolutely true. The, the, the astonishing thing is that he's yet to be prosecuted for any of We're talking to Andrea uh, Cabral. And we, we should make clear, uh, I'm sure people paid attention to the hearing, even if they didn't hear it live, they read later, there's no formal identification of Trump, but what I've read, and I'm sure you've lived, is it is never the focus of an investigation who makes the threatening call or text or tweet. It's always an intermediary referring obliquely to, in this case, the guy who reads the transcripts quite closely. So this well, is Well, Cohen, Cohen suggests that we look at the language. Yeah. I'm thinking of you. Yeah. <laughs> You remember, you know, when he sent the mob home? We finally? love you. We love we you. We love you. You know, you, you know he, he said, if you look at the language, it is exactly what he has said yeah. in speeches, and it's the same cadence and the same tone, if not the same exact words. So, Andrea <coughs> Cabral, people have no doubt heard of Ghislaine Maxwell. She was the on and off girlfriend of Jeffrey Epstein, who uh, killed himself in prison uh, when he was in prison. Allegedly. For Oh, well, yeah, yeah we, that's allegedly killed himself. Do you think he killed himself? I think no, there's more to no. the story. I, I, uh, oh, you don't? You think he was? You think he was killed? Okay, well, I, I will do. say allegedly killed himself. Then he de he wound up dead. He did in wind a cell. Up dead. Let's put it well that put, way. Yeah. Okay, so um, his on and off again girlfriend was sentenced to 20 years uh, in prison for trafficking young uh, women to Jeffrey Epstein to sexually abuse them. She got 20, as I said, she got 20 years. What did you think of the sentence? And anything surprising there or not? No, I wasn't surprised. And, it, and, and based on uh, the length of her, um, you know, criminality with Epstein and her, her abuse of all of these young girls, she deserves every day of it. I think what, what you know, what is more frustrating is that um, Epstein... It, it, you know, didn't last long enough. And what that, you know, to actually see, you have, you know, justice visited on him, but what that actually means is that um, all of the men who uh, cavorted with Epstein and took, it, and took advantage of what he was providing um, and also used these young girls, there's real question about whether or not we'll ever really know um, you know, how many people and which ones uh, were involved with him in that way. And if I were Maxwell, I'd be very worried about something happening to me in prison because she's probably uh, the only other person who could if she wanted to. Why didn't really? she? Yeah, yeah. Marjorie asked me this. Oh, I'm sorry, you say it, Marjorie. Well, I, I did wonder. We, there was a lot of talk about how she would name names, and I thought that to get a lighter might be, sense, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. So I wonder why she didn't name names. Well, I mean, I, I think it's sort of probably a very difficult decision. If you start naming names and word would leak out immediately that she was cooperating, then she probably wouldn't live to see the trial. Um, you then go to trial, you get convicted, and there didn't seem to be much question about whether or not she was going to get convicted. Um, and maybe, you know, uh, people perceive that you pose less of a threat if you shut up up until now, you haven't said anything up until now. But I don't understand it either. I would have tried to make a deal in exchange for some level of protection. Um, so what's your theory I, about... Wait, we should say, because people don't know, Former President Clinton flew on Epstein's yep. plane. Yep. Trump flew on Epstein's. We don't know what their involvement beyond that was. Obviously, we know about Prince, Prince what's Andrew. his name, Prince Andrew. Andrew. So, so what is your theory about what happened to Jeffrey Epstein, who was found dead in his cell? You corrected me on that one. Well, I, if memory serves, he was not in the general population. He was on a suicide watch, mm -hmm. right? That means that everything that can be removed from your cell that you could possibly use to harm yourself should be removed. And if I, and I believe the kind of um, garment that they wear is this sort of one piece thing without strings or ties. Right. 
so that you can't hang yourself. Now, you know, whatever bed you have has to have sheets. Right. But the way that suicides are prevented is with regular uh, checks. You are yeah. watched around the clock, essentially. I'm with you. So the issue is, how did, how did that happen? Now, I, listen, uh, people who are on Suicide Watch do find ways. People can be incredibly creative. Um, but Jeffrey Epstein, you know, the entire institution would have known who Jeffrey Epstein was and how, you know, important it would have been to make sure that no harm came to him. So that's what makes me sus inherently suspicious about... Oh. Um, the, the fact that this was able to be accomplished and, and seemingly with no one being aware of it. You know, before uh, Marjorie wants to get the fireworks, I'll be as quick as I can here. Uh, I, I, the other night I had uh, Jill Weinbanks, who I'd never met before, a Watergate prosecutor 50 years ago, who's on MSNBC now with me. And uh, she talked, we were talking about the issue of should Trump be prosecuted? Uh, you know, is it in the national interest, even if it's proven, he's, if you believe he's committed a crime? And her answer, which I'm embarrassed to think I never thought of before, is the reason why he should be prosecuted is she said, because at the time of Watergate, I, meaning Joe Wine Banks, supported the prosecution of Nixon. And had Nixon been prosecuted, she contends that a Trump-like figure would have thought twice before, or another Trump-like figure, before he uh, engages in criminal activity. So in a related question, I think this is related, uh, not only was uh, Jelaine Maxwell sentenced to 20 years, sorry, R. Kelly was sentenced to 30 years. Uh, in light of the fact that they got really serious, those are life sentences. I think he's 50, she's 61 or something. Uh, they're likely the rest of their lives in jail. Does, do stiff sentences like that on child sex trafficking have an impact on the next child, potential child sex trafficker, or am I being naive? Um, because of the nature of the crime and because uh, people get away with it more often than they are held accountable, mm -hmm. I would say no. I'd like to think otherwise, but I would say no. But that doesn't change the fact that, you know, accountability when it comes needs to be uh, among the harshest punishments mm -hmm. meted out for stuff like this. I mean, R. Kelly was 30 years too late. Everybody knew. Yeah. that Aaliyah, who was someone he married to avoid prosecution, she was 15, and she lied about her age. Yeah. And that was, I don't know, uh, what, 20-something years ago? I don't even know how long, but it was many, many, it was over a decade, well over a decade or, uh, or more ago. People have known about him forever. So this 30 years, it was, you know, he got a year for all the time that he was allowed to... Yeah. Um, continue abusing women and young girls. He's a pedophile. So I do want to get to fireworks, uh, Andrew Cabral, because I'm hearing them all over the neighborhood. It's driving me crazy. My, my, my dog is dearly departed now, so I don't have to worry about giving him Valium to get through the f July 4th season. Harry the pee. But this is a real problem. All these fireworks. Apparently, the, a lot of them were seized. 28 grand in illegal fireworks seized, seized over the weekend, uh, Massachusetts police say. But... Is that what know, you want the state police spending their time on? Is seizing no, fireworks like, illegally brought in from New Hampshire? I keep hoping someone's going to find who's setting off all these fireworks <laughs> at morning, noon, and night. Well, mostly they are at night. But still, you know, isn't it a problem? Kids no, sleep. No, I, I, I kind of do want them spending time on it. I am, I am with Marjorie on this 100%. People who set off fireworks, especially in the city, yeah. uh, or a thickly settled suburb, you know, you, it, it annoys the hell out of it. Scares pets. It frightens children. It, one, it, night. It, it, it one night. One night. I've been hearing the them all week. I, they were right. going on till like one o'clock in the morning last night in my neighborhood, which is two houses from Boston. Okay, so. we can't have fireworks because it bothers Marjorie. That's we right. can't close down bothers Copley pets. Square because it, too, it took her two minutes that. more I didn't to say drive that. to Brooklyn. Do you love dogs? You've got two of them in I your do, family. Well, my family. Do you want to terrorize your dogs? Dangerous. These They're people dangerous. blow their own hands off. Their mm -hmm. kids play with them, blow their fingers off. People get hurt. They're ne it just shouldn't happen. And I, I listen. I don't. I just don't have a problem if the police are police aren't doing it year round. They're doing it around the Fourth of July holiday, where they're where they're most likely to be brought in illegally um, from New Hampshire. And that good for them for setting up the sting and catching people one by one. Okay, but wait a <laughs> sec. I mean, you can't really believe that that's an appropriate use. Of state, either of you, state oh, I, police. You do. 
I not only do I believe that it's an appropriate use of the state police's time, when you think about the fact that, you know, uh, laws do apply to everybody, but some laws, depending on people's behavior, apply more to some than to others. The covenant of quiet enjoyment in exactly. one's home exactly. literally applies to every single person who lives somewhere. Even if you're homeless and you're, I mean, you, have, you know, you're, 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 you have some some right to not be, not be, uh, not have your neighbors or whoever's close to you um, setting off loud explosives at all hours of the night. It's How are all these people in New Hampshire so surviving this horror that you and Marjorie are describing? They're legal there. People buying them like crazy. Well, there's a little bit. They're a little bit less densely populated up there in New Hampshire. You know, they're not all on top of each other. I, maybe, maybe all the good people in the People's Republic of Cambridge are not shooting off these fireworks. You know where else they're? But they're shooting them off in where, Boston to beat the Do you know where in. else they're legal in Ro in uh, New England? Uh, uh, there, Andrea Cabral. Do you happen to know what state uh, they're, they're legal? legal they're, oh no, they're legal. Rhode in Rhode Island, Island, your home when state. When I was growing up, my uncle used to uh, rent out a park. Um, and he would, but it was, wasn't like in the neighborhoods, but he would rent out a park and, and, you know, it was part of the family 4th of July celebration and, and he would set off fireworks. Did you try to have your uncle arrested? But it, no, 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 it was, they're legal and they were, he was doing it in a, in a park so that it, there was a, a start time and an end time and it was part of, you know, uh, for everybody to enjoy. That's exactly. Than you going up on the back porch and setting off a bunch of rockets at one o'clock in the morning. Exactly. You like the boom. Exactly. That's, That's the problem. So before you what? If it can be the eve of Fourth of July, July third, July fourth, maybe July fifth. But the problem is they're starting now. They started earlier mm. in the week, and they're going to go on until July, until everybody uses up every single solitary last oh, firework they had. And remember the picture of people lined up with through? the shopping carts with the fireworks last year up in New Hampshire because <laughs> people were so upset they had nothing else to do during the pandemic. I mean, people they had more fireworks. They were taller than the people. They had to have people hoist them out to Look the car with Andrea them. Andrea and Marjorie. I mean, really? It's an outrage, Andrea. I'm with you 100%. <laughs> All I can say is, anybody who wants to set off fireworks, please do so at Jim's house. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. He really thinks it's okay for you to do this. By That's the way, right. I just moved to Brookline last week, right near Cleveland <laughs> Circle. I want yeah. you to know. Yeah, and the dogs all have heart attacks. You have to go to the vet and get special pills so the dogs Not won't have dogs. heart attacks. Not all dogs. Andrea, I'm really disappointed in you, but thanks for yeah. your thoughts on everything else. We really appreciate yeah, thank it. Thank you very so much, much. Andrea Cabral. Thank you, Marjorie. Have you heard of the Thunder shirts, Jim? What is the thunder it, show? Well, oh, you put it, shirts, wrap it around a dog, so yeah, it doesn't get freaked out. Yeah, for thunder and fireworks, but they don't really work, so you have to give them heavy drugs. One year, I gave my dog, dog too many drugs. You know what happened? Passed out. His little legs went right is out from underneath him. Is that a true story? <laughs> Dilly belly, belly flop, uh, right in the floor. But probably at least the night of his he life, didn't have too. to be terrorized by the uh, by the fireworks everywhere. Okay, that was Andrea, Andrea Cabral. thank you. Appreciate She's it. She's the former Suffolk County Sheriff and Secretary of Public Safety for the state of Massachusetts, and we thank her very much for joining us. Coming up... Oh, my God. Boston Globe environmental reporter David Abel joins us next. He's going to talk about this, what I think is a really horrible Supreme Court EPA ruling. Basically means that the EPA can't really regulate pollution, uh, coal plants, th the things that are really causing us um, terrible climate change and death and destruction and terrible environmental pollution in the United States of America. You are listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7, and we are broadcasting live today from the Boston Public Library. And by the way, after our show is over, Jim, starting at 2 o'clock, we're going to have a 90-minute discussion know, with me, Callie Crossy, great. and, and uh, Paris Alston about the Roe decision. So, so don't gonna, go away. Stay. No, it's a really important we're program. We're going to take calls yep. and texts as well. And people can call in, and we're going to talk to some people that know a lot about this. So that's from 2 to 3.30. You're listening again to 89.7 GBH, Boston Public Radio. is in. The U.S. Supreme Court has overturned the constitutional right to an abortion. It reverses Roe v. Wade. Now, let's talk about it. What does this mean for abortion rights in Massachusetts? I'm Marjorie Egan. I'm Callie Crossley. And I'm Paris Alston. We're hosting a community conversation. Join us today starting at 2 here on GBH 89.7 and streaming live at youtube.com slash GBH news. Funding for our programs comes from you 
and Lexus Broadway in Boston, presenting Wicked, returning to the Citizens Bank Opera House June 8th through July 24th. Ticket information and availability online at LexusBroadwayInBoston.com. And Boston Children's Hospital, ranked the nation's number one children's hospital by U.S. News and World Report, where families from Massachusetts and the world come for answers. BostonChildrens.org slash answers. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan live at the Boston Public Library, streaming at youtube.com slash gbhnews. Join us on Zoom to discuss today's Supreme Court decision on the EPA's ability or now inability to regulate emissions from power plants is David Abel. David, of course, reports on climate for the Boston Globe. David, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Nice to be with you guys again. Great. Well, David, uh, you cover the environment all the time. I just dip in and out of it, but I can't uh, imagine there's any bright side at all to what the Supreme Court has just done in terms of the health of this nation with basically making it much easier to pollute. Um, yeah, um, I would just say uh, without opining, um, I think for a lot of people, uh, there is a feeling of desperation, of, um, of un inability to understand how to go forward from this decision. Um, it in many ways guts the federal government's or, or uh, the administration at this point's ability to reduce emissions from power plants, which constitute uh, uh, roughly about a quarter of all of our greenhouse gas pollution. It's the second largest source of greenhouse gas pollution. And it raises questions about whether we as a country have the ability to act on our, um, on not just our ambitions, but the requirements that are necessary to avoid a climate catastrophe. We, we provide um, or we issue um, more emissions than any other country in the world right now, other than China. And historically, we have emitted more carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere than any other country on the planet. And we have to do something about that. That's not an opinion. That's a basic fact of if we want to remain uh, in a world that doesn't um, have catastrophic storms and catastrophic rising sea levels and um, and changing the way so many people live, we need to reduce our greenhouse gases and the Supreme Court just essentially made that far more difficult and, and raises significant questions about the Biden administration's goals of cutting our carbon emissions 50% below 2005 levels by the end of this decade. Um, and it's even more uh, ambitious goals. It seems like right now, it's hard to see a path to, to how we get there. You know, you said a minute ago, David Abel from the Globe, we gotta figure out a way to do this. I mean, one, uh, what, without giving people a headache, what the Supreme Court, six members of the Supreme Court said essentially, is uh, this exceeds the regulatory authority, the EPA, and we'll discuss a little bit later whether or not this will be applied to a lot of other regulatory authority that relates to public health and welfare long, well beyond the, the environment. Uh, um, but it, it, the alternative that the Supreme Court says is necessary is Congress, which is borderline laughable for those of us who have been uh, watching this dysfunctional uh, cl uh, Congress on a bunch of things, including climate change. But correct me if I'm wrong, we didn't get to read the decision. We only read summaries because it came on right before we came on the air. It came out right before we came on the air. My understanding is while they don't have broad power to regulate emissions from power plants, did the Supreme Court not say that they can in individual cases of an individual power plant? Am I right about that or am I misreading what I skimmed? 
I know I think that's that's my reading of it too and of course I only had a chance to uh, read it quickly okay. uh, before we went on air but that is my understanding but Roberts wrote that uh, you know one of his signature quotes in this decision is capping carbon dioxide emissions at a level that will force a nationwide transition away from the use of coal to generate electricity may be a sensible solution and he says this in a kind of flip way sensible so solution to the quote crisis of the day but it is not plausible that congress gave epa the authority to adopt on its own such a regulatory scheme he called um, wait he calls it the crisis, crisis of, of the, the day? day yes so, David Abel, <laughs> what does this mean, uh, uh, if you can figure it out with such little time to digest this, what does this mean specifically for New England, for Massachusetts? What's the potential impact of that right here? Well, carbon emissions are a global problem, and if we have an inability to, pers to, to effect effectively provide incentives or co-op, uh, coal and oil fired plants in other parts of the country, um, like West Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, um, those emissions will, um, will pollute the rest of the country and the planet and make it less likely that uh, globally, we can meet the obligations or the the, the goals uh, set forth by the Paris Climate sure. Accord, which was to reduce or ensure that we as a uh, planet don't exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius or 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit of warming. Um, and we are, uh, we are now likely to uh, come closer to three degrees Celsius, Celsius of warming um, and without major changes or major cuts to our emissions. And right now, this is a this is a kind of gut punch to those efforts. You know, I was thinking even if we just had Mayor Wu in Boston, she was talking about efforts they're making here to make uh, you know clean energy for buildings and and doing things at the seaport, etc. But it does seem like, as you mentioned, the places that do have a lot of coal, like West Virginia, that's Joe Manchin. Joe Manchin became a millionaire uh, thanks to the coal industry in Tennessee. That even if citizens there sued, it, it would take years, I would think, for those, suit, for those suits to wind their way through the courts. And we're, we're so running out of time. Um, that's what seems so bleak to me. That right. There don't seem to be any alternatives that are in time? From a regulatory point of view, um, I think that's a fair assessment. I think though, and again, every time I talk to you, we, we, it's a very gloomy conversation. Uh, I know. But, uh, yes. but I would Sorry. prefer if you don't call actually, David, because this is really bringing me down, but go ahead. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, to try to find some sense of hope for the future, you know, we the, this case was brought about against a, a 2014 Obama administration policy yep. called the Clean Power Plan, which never took effect. Correct. Um, and still, and here's here's a silver lining, and still, we saw power the the goals of the Clean Power Plan had been met and exceeded even before. They, um, they, they were ahead of expectations, even though the policy didn't come about. And the, and the reason behind that is because the markets changed and technology changed. And so we saw the market essentially um, co-opt the industry to reduce the amount of coal-fired plants and oil fired plants and switch to a somewhat less polluting source of fossil fuels, natural gas. And we've seen power plant emissions decline over the last 10 or 20 years, I don't know exactly how long, by more than 20%. So that suggests that there is a path beyond government regulation. And that path will hopefully include new technologies that will move us beyond um, what we now know is far more polluting than we actually believed it to be 
before, but natural gas and fracking and um, and uh, and existing coal and and um, and oil fired plants are not economical in the way they were in the past. And so solar, wind, hydropower, and other forms of clean energy backed up by sto battery storage are now becoming far more economical and in fact are less expensive for the most part than most fossil fuel plants. So, so rather than just focusing on the gloom and the inefficacy of the federal government's ability to actually respond, the hope is that the market will, um, will save us. Um, but that might be a, a thin read. A of thin hope. read. Well, okay, I'll wonder, take no, it. No, 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 I won't. <laughs> can we uh, return to the gloom for, uh, for sure, a second? Sure. Uh, and this is goes beyond uh, the the frightening part of this decision, as I touched on before, beyond just the impact on the environment, on the climate, is this whole question about what's the Supreme Court's perspective on the regulatory authority of virtually any agencies, whether I'm sure people remember Supreme Court struck down the effort by the CDC not that long ago to uh, uh, to have a more impose a moratorium on eviction, saying it's exceeded their regulatory authority. And the reason it made me think of that is when you mentioned a minute ago, David Abel, that the clean power plant itself never went into effect, court observers say that's the scariest part of this. Because under normal circumstances, the Supreme Court would say, well, since it's not in effect, there's no reason to even take the case. Come back to us when it is in effect. The fact that they chose to take this case and render an anti-regulatory decision suggests to people far smarter than I in terms of the Supreme Court, it suggests that what they want to do is the far broader thing. Start with the EPA, strip them of a lot of regulatory authority, and then go down the line to other agencies when it comes to health, uh, uh, a whole variety of, uh, of uh, things. I know you're not a, an administrative law expert, but <laughs> don't you have the same read, David Abel? Um, well, two things. The first thing I would say is that, number one, um, in addition to the court um, uh, deciding to rule on this, even though this policy never came to be, they decided to rule on it after the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of That's Columbia, the, the, the nation's you know, second uh, highest court, arguably, ruled that the plan that the Trump administration was required to substitute for the um, to the clean power plan, which they called the affordable clean energy rule, was based on, quote, a fundamental misconstruction of the Clean Air Act and was prompted, they wrote, by a tortured series of misreadings. So the, the, so the Supreme Court decided to uh, basically disregard the, the U.S. Court of Appeals in D.C.'s um, ruling on this. And, and I would just say that, that that's one arguably galling way to look at their, their ruling today. But there is a slightly uh, more positive way, which is touching on what you're saying. There was concerns that the ruling would go further than it did. Yeah, in that itself. Right. Essentially, that the, yeah. the Supreme Court today would gut the ability of any federal agency to effectively uh, issue regulations. It, this is, you know, the the dream on some on some levels of the attack on the on the so-called administrative state, right. and it doesn't appear from my reading of my quick reading of the ruling that it went that far. However, so I, I'm sorry to every to counter all the optimism you have. It's really <laughs> analogous to the BS from Alito in the uh, Dobbs case, uh, according to people who have far more expertise, for example, like Mar Margaret Marshall, former Chief Justice of the SJC, was with us two weeks ago, and when the original opinion was leaked, and the Alito opinion says, no, 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 this is just about abortion, not the kinds of things that we later found out that Clarence Thomas said they should be uh, uh, ruling out, like contraception, same-sex marriage, et, et cetera. This plants the flag, in my estimation, if this court is to be true to itself. And while I hope you are right, the narrower ruling itself is the beginning and the end, as bad as it is, it seems to me, it's just my opinion, 
that it opens the door. We're talking to David Abel, climate reporter for the Boston Globe. So, David Abel, as I said before, as Jim just said, you're the climate reporter. So, you must be constantly uh, dealing with people in your lives who are climate deniers or they ask you about climate change. There's a very disturbing oh my God. story um, uh, that was from uh, reported by National Public Radio, basically, that if you, you have enough media coverage of climate change, which we don't, I, I think it's too bad that we don't say these storms could be related to climate change, the wildfires related to climate change, blah, 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 or meteorologists don't say that enough. <coughs> but in any case, that some media coverage of climate change that is about those kinds of things can influence the way Americans feel about climate change until they see another article that's skeptical and they switch back to their original opinion. So I'm wondering what your sense is of of, I know polls do show that we are worried about this, um, but what's your sense of how deep and strong the commitment is to, to climate change and, and the coming climate catastrophe if we don't do anything? Do you think people believe it? Well, we did a poll on this uh, question, um, on some of these questions um, in Massachusetts um, at the Boston Globe a few months ago and clearly, the vast majority of the people, at least in Massachusetts, uh, have no have no doubt that climate change is a clear and present danger, and that we need to do something about it. We I think we discussed this uh, yeah. some months ago, um, and I think nationally, there's uh, also little question that I think you know there is a a, a significant uh, majority of people who recognize that this is a problem. That I think the gulf though is in translating that understanding or that appreciation that this is a crisis or a threat um, to how do you address it? And what happens when, when all of a sudden gas prices go up 50% in the course of a couple of months or your electricity prices, which I think uh, National Grid where Eversource today just announced that they're hiking their their electricity rates for for gas. So, you know, what do, how do people respond when it might cost more, um, or it, it might require things that are not so easy, like you know, not using a gas stove or using a, a, an electric stove or an induction stove, or using heat pumps. Uh, as opposed to, um, a, you know, a natural gas fired furnace or something like that. And these things are expensive and it requires, um, it requires national and statewide programs that will enable this transition. And that leaves us in the conundrum of being in a politically divided country where it's very difficult to move the ball. Um, and again, to come back to what I was saying earlier, that's why hopefully market coercion and market changes will help us move in this direction. And just to add a slightly positive note, Good. You know, the, the, price of, the price of solar, the cost of solar, the cost of wind have come down yeah. you know, so much and so quickly that I think that has you know, bent the curve and made the, these conversations and hope still possible. You know, before you leave, a guy who says that to us every month about the cost going down is the guy who started all this, in its essence, Bill McKibben. But McKibben also, since we have uh, been willing, Marjorie and I, to blame Congress for their total lack of concern for virtually anything that real people really care about, uh, uh, Bill McKibben was the guy behind the idea that uh, Joe Biden could uh, embrace the Defense Production yep. Act and have tens of thousands of heat pumps manufactured, shipped right. at cost or less to Europe, which wouldn't have solved, filled the whole hole created if they had cut off gas and oil from uh, Russia in an attempt to support Ukraine, but would have filled a decent percentage of the hole. He told us, and he wrote a piece in the Washington Post saying the conversations with the Biden administration, which unilaterally could have done this, they didn't need the support of Congress, that the Biden administration was supportive, or at least open to it, and as far as I know, nothing has happened. So there are things that Joe Biden can do, even if he can't use his EPA to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from power plants, 
There are other things he could be doing on the environmental front without Congress, should he choose to. Not as much as he needs to do, but some things, correct or no? That's true. That, that's true. And I think actually, uh, my understanding is that the Biden administration has invoked the Defense Production Act to help uh, with a variety of climate oriented goals, including building heat pumps. Oh, I didn't know I'm, that. I, I, and I, I shouldn't, I, 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 we'll check. I, I think, but I don't know if it, you know, is exactly what Bill McKibben was calling for in terms of, you know, creating a kind of Marshall plan yeah, of heat exactly. pumps for Europe. But, um, you know, I, I do believe the Biden administration has invoked uh, the Defense Production Act to help. That's good news. I was unaware. David, yeah. it's really always good to talk to you despite the glo Well, you're actually not as gloomy as we are, so no, thank you. No, he's much more. He gave us thank several points that. of hope, and we're clinging to them desperately, <laughs> is what we're doing, David Abel. Well, I, I, I'll <laughs> let me just end on this note. From okay, Marie we're Hagen ready. Her descent, just, just to keep it you know, back on a gloomy note. Her, her, one of her uh, most noteworthy statements in dissent was, the court appoints itself instead of Congress or the expert agency, the, the decision maker on climate policy. I cannot think of many things more frightening. Oh, I know. I know from Kagan that was horrible. <laughs> David Abel. <laughs> okay, on that dire and depressing note, thank you very much. It's David, a tough. And tough before you go, to David, our colleagues just checked it out. I'm not sure heat pumps, but uh, some other key energy technologies. He has. Uh, 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 embrace the uh, the uh, Defense Production Act to do some things. So you're right, and thanks for the correction. Good Thank to see you, you David. Much. Be well. Thanks, guys. David Abel reports on climate and the environment for the Boston Globe. Coming up, we're going to... Oh, excuse me. A limited, uh, a small, I'm uh, reading more, some heat pump production, not on the scale as David said well, on the Marshall Plan, like for Europe, but some heat pump. And how is Russia paying for this war decimating Ukraine? Still with the money they're getting. Fossil. In fact, we read this morning their profit margin has gone on up. oil and gas is it's even higher up. than yeah. it was before the war. If we weren't dependent on fossil fuels, that, that, correct. that would be in a much different situation. Correct. Anyway, we're going to open the uh, phone and text lines and get your take on the Supreme Court decisions today, curbing the Environmental Protection Agency's ability uh, to protect the environment, regulate emissions, and what it means for uh, an impending climate catastrophe. You're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH. The January 6th attack on the Capitol wasn't the end of the election denial movement, it was the beginning. Our voice has gotten bigger and bigger every single day since last year, and you can't stop that. An NPR investigation tracks the movements of conspiracy theorists as they traveled the country spreading lies. This afternoon on All Things Considered from NPR News. Today at 4, here on GBH News 89.7. Our programs are made possible thanks to you. And Franciscan Children's. As we face a kid's mental health emergency in the U.S., Franciscan Children's provides help for your entire family by phone, online, or in a parental support group. Learn more at franciscanchildrens.org. And the Museum of Science, where you can discover something new each time you visit. Summertime is limited, though your experiences at the Museum of Science are not. Tickets at mos.org. Trusted. Local. News. This is 89.7 WGBH, WGBH HD1 Boston, online at gbhnews.org. Boston's local NPR. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio, uh, Jim Brady and Marjorie. And we're live at the Boston Public Library, streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. We're here till 2, but do not go away, either if you're listening on the radio or here. A terrific community forum, community conversation about the impact of uh, the Dobbs decision overturning Roe, uh, led by Callie Crossley, Paris Olson, and Marjorie Egan, starting at 2 o'clock, 2 to 3.30, right here in the Boston Public Library. If you're not here, I would suggest you uh, come on down. We wanted to spend just a couple of minutes to depress ourselves even more than we are already. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong, Marjorie, and there are a lot of other decisions which unfortunately are getting short shrift. Last Thursday, six, the Supreme Court made our communities less safe with the gun decision. Mm -hmm. Friday, they made women lot less safe with well, the Dobbs. They made women unequal in the United States They did, America. on Friday, uh, uh, with the Dobbs decision overturning right. Roe. And today, they made our air less safe 
Correct. with this uh, decision. So I'm not even sure where we go with this. One, we'd like your reaction to this uh, regulatory decision around the EPA today, which is, uh, I think, catastrophic and uh, re in response to uh, David Abel's attempt to remove the gloom. If anybody thinks the market is going to keep our climate clean, our air clean, without government, a uh, heavy hand of government, I would suggest we just look at the last hundred years in this country, and I think we know the answer to that question, and not to mention the Congress. But what's your reaction? I mean, th this is, every one of these decisions is anti-majoritarian. Every single yep. one. Two-thirds of the American people, give or take a couple, Marjorie, are on the other side of the gun issue, on the other side of reproductive freedom issue, on the other side of the climate change issue, and they not only don't give a damn, did you, the language that I was unaware of, because I hadn't read the decision, the David Abel, thing? The, no, the, the thing from Roberts. Oh yeah. The, the crisis, crisis of, of the, the day. day. The I know. crisis of the, meaning sort of poo-pooing it, it's, a, it's, a, it's in vogue well, right it, now. It, but it, it's so crazy because it's an existential crisis. I mean, people, it are, is people are upset. We had this horrible story about migrants coming across the border, uh, dying basically from the plus, heat. Yeah. And that is the hottest it's ever been in that area of the country, ever been, the hottest June it's ever been. If people are worried about migration now, wait till they see Excellent what people point. are doing. They're starving to death, or their crops won't grow because there's such a drought, or they just, they're can't stand the baking. I mean, this is happening right now. And Can it's I attach numbers to what you just said? Because I learned that this morning, too. I think I have the numbers right. The typical number of days in San Antonio where it's above 100 mm -hmm. in June are nine in a month. This month, before today, was 16. Almost double the right. number of days over 100 in San Antonio. Right, and, and we're going to have many days over 90 degrees uh, here as well. So the point is, it, we have to ward this off, and it seems as though we're not going to ward it off. And it is a little depressing. Listen to this from Marianne from Beverly. My 27-year-old daughter just started a job at the EPA with focus on environmental oh health. She's passionate about the health of our citizens and our planet. She's furious and terrified over the Supreme Court's ruling. If we don't have federal regulations to assure we have clean air and clean water, then we are doomed. These conservative justices are killing any progress we've made for the environment and for women's rights. What's next? That's an excellent question, Marianne. What's next is making a lot of us nervous. And all, right, I talk a lot about Cape Cod because I spend a lot of time there. My parents got a place there a million years ago. And the, the groundwater is full of these forever no. chemicals. Mm -hmm. the, the lakes are shutting down. The ocean is getting polluted. You're seeing the lobster fishermen moving north and north and, and north and north because the, the ocean is getting so warm. So, and not to mention the wildfires and the hurricanes and houses falling into the ocean uh, because the, 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 the sea is ever rising. So it's a disaster. I'll shut up now. Well, well no, I actually, since I've been such a downer, can I, uh, before we take calls, yep. uh, end this discussion really positive yes. note? Supreme Court can't screw us again until October. So, I mean, isn't that... Oh, well, actually, they can with emergency petitions, but essentially they are yeah. not back yeah. until October. If people don't know, it's their and last day. And the racism, day. by the way, in that Louisiana case was oh unbelievable, my God. too. You know, we're talking the about electoral the, map yes, issue. Yes, the electoral map that it, a lower court had said was basically to screw black voters. They said that's fine, too. You know, I was thinking about Ketanji Brown-Jackson, like arriving on the Supreme Court. Clarence Thomas, obviously an African-American man, who benefited enormously from affirmative action. And admits action. it, by the way. He was, he was a part of a class that was at Holy Cross, when Holy Cross was trying to get mm -hmm. more diverse people there, and he, that it benefited him. And he's against affirmative action. You wonder about somebody like Ketanji Brown Jackson sitting with these people next to her that thinks that screwing black voters, no problem. <laughs> Can I have one more thing? A texter, and thank you, you didn't sign it. I totally forgot about this. You remember when Amy Coney Barrett during right. confirmation she issue. was act about, oh, yeah. asked about, as you say, the existential issue of our time, yeah. climate change? What was her response? I, I don't really know much about it. <laughs> I, I really haven't thought about it. And by the way, uh, you know, everybody pointed out the six Catholics in the Supreme Court on abortion. Well, the six Catholics on this, that are sitting in the Supreme Court now, Bill McKibben, probably the premier environmentalist in America, has said the person who wrote the most compelling yes, emergency uh, uh, essay, or not essay, it was a whole big long Encyclical treatise, or whatever, you call whatever you call it, on the climate was Pope Francis. So, you know, I mean, they're I Catholics when they want to be. I guess he's right on abortion, and he's obviously and wrong well, on climate. Well, even Francis says it is not all about abortion. You're right. The poor, the poor, the poor is what he always says, but they conveniently forget that when they're doing the bidding of uh, big oil and big gas. Lisa and Medway, you've been patient. Welcome to the show. It's Boston Public Radio at the library. Hi, Lisa. 
Hi, Jim and Marjorie. Hey. I love your show. Thank I'm you. calling in because I wanted to make a comment on this topic, but Please. I literally usually want to call every single day. <laughs> I've had to take on the motto of Juliet Kayyem, which is pace, pace the race. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's a good one. I literally can't take it. I can't take it anymore. Um, but anyways, I'm enraged about Friday's decision. I'm enraged about the gun decision, and I'm enraged about today's decision on the environment. I am calling with hopefully something hopeful oh, because good. I just recently Great. I just recently did some research on the topic of sustainability and I know that a lot of corporations are doing what they can to reduce their carbon emissions and measure their carbon footprint and the SEC is coming down with a lot of regulations around this and also what I learned is that consumers are want this Companies are only going to start doing business with other companies who are sustainable. So I'm just hoping maybe the corporations, again, will be the ones that help with the climate change Can I, uh, versus our I'm, government. People are going to hate me even more for being the downer of downers today. Lisa, <laughs> you mentioned uh, the SEC. Uh, mm -hmm. Most analysts, when they were looking at the regulatory issue vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the EPA today, said the ne mm -hmm. next target is the SEC's requiring that climate impact be taken into account uh, uh, by corporations, which is an SEC regulation. So uh, it's terrific now, and it is very likely mm -hmm. to fall. I hope you're right, and I hope I'm mm -hmm. viewing this too broadly. And Lisa, we really appreciate your kind words and your call. Call us again soon. 877-301-8970. Well, the only th thing that I find hopeful is, is the idea that people will be so upset about these things and so worried about the future of the country and the world that the that the motivation will be bottom up as opposed to top down. I hope. Th that maybe, hope. Uh, you know, 20 somethings that are so concerned about this will lobby themselves for companies to do the right thing and not work at those places. You already hear about people planning their, women planning their college educations or where they want to yes. live based on the places where you can still uh, have access to abortion. So forget college kids. There was a story in the Globe or the Post or the Times today, one of the three this morning, saying that women are deciding, not college students, grown women. Jobs. About where to live yeah. and where to work. Yeah. Based, which is totally understandable. Dave in a car. Hi. Oh, hi. Hi. Uh, yeah, I've tried to calm down since I talked to your screener. You don't have to. These conversations make me so angry. I could spit. I'm so mad. I'm trying right now to put solar panels on a commercial building in Massachusetts and on my home in Connecticut. I have money to pay. Take my money. Put the solar panels on my building. How hard is that? What's the, the problem? Has to step in. Government has to step in and get rid of these scam artists, these con artists, and they have to say, "Here's a list of people who will do it honestly. Here's a list of people who can do it right away. And if you're not on the list, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, you should be taken off the list." And the government needs some type of an omnibus ban to go out and help people get this done. When you drive by any building in Massachusetts, you've got to say to yourself, why aren't there solar panels on that building? And the answer nine times out of ten is because the owner of the building just can't deal with the con artists and the paperwork that has to be done just to put solar panels on a roof. Dave, I, that, that is a great call. I'm unaware of, of the con artists and the scams, but I'm sure you're right, and I'm sure that uh, expense is another big problem. He's saying consumers need help. I mean, yeah, they need consumers, assistance. Th that's a great point, Dave. Paul Thank in Worcester makes a great point, too. He, he texts and says, thanks a lot, Supreme Court. Now I'm out of ketchup, and my plates are all broken. 877 <laughs> oh. Tell people what Andy Borowitz said. Oh, Andy Borowitz is our favorite satirist from the New Yorker. Yes. And he wrote a piece this morning. You know, Trump's, I don't, I don't even know who Hutchinson is, what I've never yeah, met her. don't know Cassie Hutchinson. He writes a piece yeah. that's ten times funnier than this. I just don't have it up. He says, I don't even know ketchup. He said, mayonnaise, <laughs> yes, mustard, maybe. I don't even know ketchup. Yeah. But that is I just, thought that was great. Eight, eight, seven, seven, I'm sorry. Eight, go I'm just going to repeat the number. 877-301-8970. BPR. Uh, nope, we don't do the emails anymore. We do the Catholic. We do the Catholic. We do the text and the phone calls. At What's the Catholic thing Well, I somebody just pointed out that Sotomayor is Catholic. I know. There are six of them on there that are the uh, six of them uh, that are Catholics. I think Gorsuch, Gorsuch started out as a Catholic know. and it became an Episcopalian. I don't know. But anyway, okay. Um, 
877-301-8970. Where are we going? We're you going know, to Tom and Brockton. Before you go to Tom and Brockton, what? You, know, you know, this is sort of like how I reacted to the Dobbs decision on Friday. Mm -hmm. Intellectually, we all knew it was coming because we saw the leaked Alito opinion. But then when it becomes reality, it's a whole different kettle of fish. I feel the same way about this EPA thing. We all knew, based upon oral argument, that this is the direction. Was it going to be five votes, five to four, six to three? But then... They're basically saying, it, not only this crisis of the day thing, which literally gives me, makes me shudder from Roberts and his opinion, they're basically saying uh, uh, regulatory agencies can't regulate. It is the job of Congress at a time when, at least in our lifetime, we have the most dysfunctional Congress, unable to deal with virtually anything, and that's the lack of reality within which these six members of the Supreme Court... I don't think it's a lack of reality at all. I think that... The, I, I've said this a million times, so I might not say it again, Marjorie. I think what they do is distract you with all these wedge issues, like abortion mm -hmm. and gay marriage and anything else that's like a social issue, because what their real agenda is yeah. what they're doing, is right. to make corporate America right. run everything, workers' rights g get squashed, and that's what this is about. This that's is what, what Senator Whitehouse believes with the dark Absolutely. money thing. Absolutely. I think this yeah. is what the Federal Society has done very cleverly. I mean, they're saying the health of, of, of Americans doesn't really matter. You can just be sucking in all this bad air from, from these power plants and stuff, but we don't care about that. We don't care about that. And why would they not care about that? Because that makes a guy like Joe Manchin can make more money yeah. from coal You're plants, right. no and fossil fuel people that fund campaigns can make more money from uh, oil companies and fossil fuel companies. Tom from Brockton, thank you for calling. Welcome, Tom. Okay. I'm a union electrician. I'm retired. Mm -hmm. April of 1991, I was working in Clarksburg, West Virginia, working on a, a project that was going to put scrubbers on the, on the Harrison Power Plant in Lumberport, West Virginia. What's a scrubber? Our before you, Wait, Tom, tell me what a scrubber is first, please. Pollution. It takes away the particulates from burning coal. Okay, yeah. thank you. Go ahead. All right, and, and, and we can thank that because of the Clean Air Act of the 1980s. Remember the term acid rain? Mm -hmm, of yep. Okay, yeah. so... We, we here in the United States, because of the environmental movement, um, lobbied Congress to pass what was common sense environmental regulation mm -hmm. called the Clean Air Act. You do realize that China, India, and other countries throughout the world do not have scrubbers on their power plants. You are aware of that, correct? I am I'm now. I'm aware that China pollutes more than we do. We're second. Okay, and here's the point when I get into these discussions with progressives here in Massachusetts. We have approximately 250 coal-fired power plants in this country where we obviously have gotten rid of the particulates with the scrubbers. Many of them inject the fumes into the ground, which is called clean technology, which is very expensive. China has over 1,100 coal-fired power plants where even before the pandemic you had people wearing masks because the pollution is that bad and china is on the other side of the world however their emissions are affecting the worldwide so what's your point so what's your point, what's your point? So what's because your point? they're should, really yeah. screwing the world so we, should we can okay. screw it a little um, please no what's, i'm what's asking a question i'm not pleased anything you're making a point we're both saying, and your point is what? We accept and, your facts. And, and why are you, Jim, yeah. why are you raising your voice to me? Tom, please <laughs> answer the question. Why, what, what is, is your point? point? My point is, with going to green energy in this country, yes, we should be going to that. But you don't cripple our oil and natural gas output where it's harming working people like myself, and that's what the Biden administration has done. Well, by the and way, Tom, with all due respect, people who uh, I respect, who have a lot of knowledge about these issues, uh, believe that conversion from fossil fuels will not only save the planet, but be a huge, huge job producer. So that's sort of a fundamental disagreement. Nobody wants to put you out of work, Tom, or you're retired, or put people like you out of work. They just want you to be working in a different sector of the energy economy. Tom, thank you for the call. 
we appreciate. And you know what the other problem is, even with, uh, and by the way, David Abel said the same thing Tom said, that a greater contributor to right. greenhouse gases is China. We're number two. This gives, this Supreme Court decision gives even more credibility to the Chinese Indian perspective. The United States isn't even doing it. If the leader on this issue, in quotes, is not policing these power plants and their emissions, then why the hell should we? So respectfully, you know, Tom, I'm other, not with you. The other argument, too, industries fail all the time. The industry I spent my life in is failing, the newspaper industry. But the, the idea that because your industry is failing, you should get to continue to pollute the planet and, and, and ruin the environment, it just, it just it doesn't really stand up. You know, I don't think the taxi drivers liked Uber very much, did they? No, it did, they did not. Mike from Worcester, thank you for calling. Hey, Mike. Um, yeah, I'm calling because I can't stand the similarity between our former president who was deposed or voted out of office and his agenda being carried out by the Supreme Court. I cannot stand this. This is ridiculous. You know, where did we vote the Supreme Court uh, governmental powers to eliminate procedures, regulations, and, and stuff that would support this Constitution instead of denying the rights of those people. Well, uh, Mike, let me quote uh, uh, Barack Obama, who says elections have consequences. And as we've said ad nauseum the last few days, uh, our one interview with candidate Trump, the first question we asked him, we were the first to ask him, do you have a litmus test for the Supreme Court nominees? His first answer was, to quote him, his term, I, uh, yes, pro-life. So there should have been no surprise that when he picked three people for the Supreme Court, there are going to be five or six votes to do the anti-majoritarian thing that he did. So I, be I bemoan the outcome too, Mike, but we essentially got what he told us he was going to deliver. Mike, thank you for the, uh, for the call. Let's listen to this from, to from Troy and Danvers. When it comes to public opinion, I believe some people are trapped in psychological uh, trap by identity politics. My whole family is diehard conservative, Trump or nothing. But when I asked my mom, she said she supports pro-choice, uh, pro so she's uh, uh, choice in abortion. She's against guns, and she's pro the environment. But she will never admit that Trump does not stand for what she does. And it's extremely uh, scary, but very fascinating, too. What's the best example, before we break, about identity politics? One of the great skits ever is Jimmy Kimmel sends a reporter out oh. years ago to Hollywood Boulevard, and he has the reporter say, which do you prefer, the Affordable Care Act or uh, Obamacare? And the answer from almost everybody is, I love the Affordable Care Act. And what did they hate? Obamacare. Obamacare. <laughs> Talk about identity Paul. I mean, I think that texter nailed it. Yeah, no, it, 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 is a, um, it is a great point. Thank you, Troy from Danvers. Thank, Thank you, all you, the Troy. other uh, callers and emailers. I'm sorry we couldn't get to everybody. Okay, coming up, we are going to talk with MIT economist John Gruber to make sense of the economic uncertainty hanging over us, inflation, the price of everything going up, unemployment, all of that. You are listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH. We are broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library. Thank you to the more than 1,800 people who gave during our summer membership drive. We did meet our overall goal, and the show of support was incredible. Your investment is already at work, bringing you the news, analysis, and conversation that help you make sense of these complex times. Thank you from all of us at GBH. You really do make what we do possible. Support for our programs comes from you. And North Shore Music Theater, Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella, adds a few new twists to the makeover story. On stage at Bill Haney's North Shore Music Theater from July 12th through July 24th, nsmt.org. And Boston Children's Hospital, ranked the nation's number one children's hospital by U.S. News and World Report, where families from Massachusetts and the world come for answers. bostonchildrens.org slash answers.
Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy, Marjorie, and live at the Boston Public Library, streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. New data out this morning from the Federal Reserve. The personal consumption expenditures price measure, whatever that is, grew by more than 6% this year through May, indicating inflation is still red hot. You probably knew that. We're joined now on Zoom by economist John Gruber to help us make sense of the inflation numbers, what the Federal Reserve is doing to bring them down, and if it could all spark a recession. And what would a recession actually mean for real people. John's the Ford Professor of Economics at MIT. He was instrumental in creating both the Massachusetts Health Care Reform and the Affordable Care Act. His latest book is Jumpstarting America, How Breakthrough Science Can Revive Economic Growth and the American Dream. John Gruber, it's good to see you. Good to see you guys too. So John, this is not an area of gr where Jim and I have uh, <laughs> uh, great expertise or any expertise you might say. So uh, let's start with inflation. Why is this happening? Well, this is actually an area which is not my area of expertise as well. E economics, we think of as micro and macro, and I'm a micro guy. This is a macro topic, but I will do my best to uh, explain what's going on. So I, I, I think that inflation is fundamentally about too much money chasing too few goods. So what does that mean? Let's talk about both sides of that equation. On the money side, this is about how much consumers want to spend. And this in turn is driven by two things the amount of money consumers have in their pocket and whether they wanna save it or spend it. Now the pandemic stimulus put a lot of money in people's pockets. Basically as a nation, we decided for better or worse that we didn't want people to suffer, but in doing so we actually gave other people sort of more money than they needed. Um, so people have money. At the same time, interest rates are incredibly low. So why save it? You might as well spend it. So basically, you've got a situation where you've got people have money in their pockets from the stimulus. There's, they might as well spend it because interest rates are low. And as a result, you've got a lot of money chasing goods. Meanwhile, what causes the re we don't have enough goods because there is a supply chain bottleneck. Basically, we've got still the hangover from the pandemic has led there to be not enough of everything from semiconductors to milk. And essentially top that all off with the fact that many people have decided not, go back, not to go back to work as hard as they did before. And you've got a situation where consumers have a lot of money and they want to spend it. Producers aren't producing the quantity of goods that they need to meet that money. That means there's too much money chasing too few goods. You know, John Gerber, I'm sure you've heard President Biden often say this is Putin's inflation. The suggestion being that uh, the war, his decision to... Uh, attempt to annihilate Ukraine is the primary reason here. What, I don't mean what percentage, what part of the, the inflation blame falls on Putin's behavior in Ukraine? Look, it's impossible to say, um, but you know, uh, I'll, I'll take my best guess. If I had to guess, if you think about inflation blame, I would say probably, you know, 50, you know, 60% of it is the hangover from the pandemic and the supply chain issues that have resolved, probably, 25% or 20% is sort of too much government money injected into the economy and another sort of 20% is the war. Okay. So it matters, uh, but it's not the primary driver. Okay, so uh, I had a fairly smart guy on my television show a couple of weeks ago, former president of Harvard, former uh, Treasury Secretary Larry Summers. Your favorite guy. Uh, Summers, well, I'm not <laughs> taking any stand. He was very good. He attempted to explain to me unsuccessfully, not because of his lack of skills, but because of my lack of understanding, this trade-off, for lack of a better expression, between inflation and unemployment, and when they diverge in ways like they have diverged now. Could you take a second crack at that and sure. tell us why we should care about it? Sure. So basically, um, let's go back to our inflation story. What can the government do about inflation? Well, remember, the problem is people have too much money and they want to spend it. So there's two things they can do. One is they can put less money in people's pockets. This is exactly the concern that Joe Manchin expressed that yes. killed the Build Back Better legislation. Right, exactly. Uh, I think he was misplaced, but that was his concern. The second is they can make savings more attractive by raising the interest rate. They can basically say, look, let, let's tempt you to instead of spending your money, save it by making savings more attractive. I mean, for years we've dealt with, you know, 0.1% rates on our bank. Let's make that three or 4% and let's make it interesting to actually put your money in the bank. Well, what's the problem with that? Well, the flip side of less spending is less economic activity. And let's think of the simplest possible example, okay? If the Federal Reserve raises interest rates, that means that monthly mortgage costs go up when you buy a house. Of course. 
So there's fewer people buying houses. If there's fewer people buying houses, there's fewer houses being built. Building houses is a major driver of jobs in our economy. So essentially you have a situation where the government is putting the brakes on the economy, both by sending people less money and by trying to make savings more attractive relative to spending. That is leading people to save more and spend less. And that leads there to that lower spending leads there to be fewer jobs in the economy. And basically that leads to what's called the fundamental economic trade-off often goes by the name of the Phillips curve, which is to fight inflation, we have to slow the economy down, which causes unemployment. Yeah, I remember- Hold on, I want to know, Jim, Jim, how did I do compared to Larry? Hang on, I don't, I don't <laughs> want to get in trouble with that guy, but I actually almost get it now, John. That was okay, very good. impressive. We're talking to John Gruber from MIT. Well, the, the, the other thing I remember, back in the 70s when we had these huge, you know, you, you bought a house and it was, I don't know, 10%, 12%, 15%, huge interest rates mm -hmm. on, on everything, that, um, and Jimmy Carter got in a lot of trouble about the state of the economy, not to mention the gas prices then and gas lines and all that kind of stuff. But I thought one of the criticisms back in the 70s was that the Fed did not raise the interest rates soon enough to, um, to ward off, you know, economic disaster. W tell us about the 70s, what was right and what was wrong, because it was a mess then. It was a mess. And this is where economics gets a lot more speculative than it even is. Even if you, I know you guys already think it's speculative, but this is the really speculative part. The best explanation I think that we have for what happened in the 70s is essentially what we call inf entrenched inflation expectations. What that meant was people thought inflation would keep going up. So they went to their bosses and asked for a raise saying, look, stuff's gonna cost more next year, you gotta pay me more. The bosses paid them more, which meant the bosses had to raise the price of the goods they were selling, which meant inflation went up and it became this sort of ongoing cycle. The big question and so basically what the Fed had to do was essentially send a strong enough signal that, hey, guys, inflation's not going up. You don't have to give raises because we're going to crutch down on the economy as inflation doesn't go up. And that meant creating a huge recession, which was the early 1980s recession, the early Reagan years recession. Um, now, the question now is, do we have to do that again? And Larry Summers is on one side of this debate. Larry thinks we sort of have to, that we've got to get pretty tough with interest rates to avoid that from happening again. Paul Krugman's on the other side of the debate where he's saying, look, it's not clear we have to do that as much. And the big difference is if you look at people's expectations today, they don't expect inflation to be out of control in a year or two. They expect to come under control. So Krugman's point is we're not in the 1970s anymore where people are just like panicked about inflation. So they're demanding raises and that's causing the spiral. He thinks it's going to resolve. He thinks the Fed should act and they did. But it's not like the Fed has to overreact. And by but, the way, speaking of the Fed, Powell, the head of the Fed, is in the Summers camp, is he not? Isn't, isn't, uh, well, actually, we have, well, we have some sound from him. Maybe you can explain it. Here is uh, uh, Jerome Powell, chair of the Fed, talking about the Fed's priorities, checking inflation, he says, and, and keeping the U.S. out of a recession. Here he is. We're very strongly committed to using our tools to get inflation to come down. The way to do that is to slow down growth, ideally keep it positive. And as I mentioned, supply and demand get back into balance. So that, that's what we're trying to accomplish. Is there a risk that we would go too far? Certainly there's a risk. But uh, I, I, I wouldn't agree that it's the, the biggest risk to the economy. I think that, you know, the, the, the bigger mistake to make, let's put it that way, would be to fail to restore price stability. He said, what he seems to be saying to me is if the cost of controlling inflation is a recession, and you're going to explain what a recession means in real terms to us in a minute, it's a cost I'm willing to pay. Am I misinterpreting that? You're not at all. You're not at all. And that is the standard economics view that dominated until 20 years ago, which was- Until 20 years ago? Yeah. He's the head uh, of the Fed now. You know that, right? I, 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 know, I, I, I I'm, not, I'm not saying it's not important now, but it was, it was an unambiguous consensus until 20 years okay. ago, which was, look, at the end of the day, um, Inflation is forever. Unemployment is temporary. Uh, if you have to have a few years of high unemployment to That's crush right. inflation, it's worth it. I think the reason that consensus has weakened some is for two reasons. First of all, we've had 20 years of low unemployment and low inflation. So this notion of a sort of that we have to, to have low inflation, you have to have high unemployment or vice That's versa, right. just doesn't seem to be true. Um, and so that sort of, so that consensus has really sort of not quite as strong as it was. The second thing that's happened is 
labor economists, and this is the field in which I work much more myself, have documented that unemployment is not just a short run cost, it's a long run cost. For example, people who graduate college during a down economy earn less the rest of their lives. Yeah. Mm. So there's, there's actually, so there was this view when I was a kid uh, in grad school and stuff that gee, infl- you had to be, it was worth a few years of unemployment to beat back inflation. It's not as clear that that view is as right as it was. Now it's still the view that most people who hold the, hold the strings of macro have, including Powell. But I don't know that it's quite the consensus it was. And I think as a result, the Fed will not be as quick to jack up rates as they would have been 20 years ago. I think this is 20 years ago, the rates will be going up much faster. I think the Fed is saying, wait a second, um, you know, unemployment does matter. It's not just prices mm-hmm. that matter. And we have to walk this line, I think, a little more carefully than they might have in the past. We're talking to John Gruber so, from MIT. So it sounds to me, John Gruber, as if this is kind of a big guessing game. And you, you have Paul Krugman thinking one thing, Larry Summers thinking another thing, maybe somebody thinking a third thing, that we don't, we don't really know what, what's the right path. Absolutely. We, we, we don't know. Um, and that's what I keep telling you guys. The economists are, are not so good at the prediction part. We're good yeah. at the explaining part. And, and we don't know. We know directionally that the economy has been running too hot, that we know looking backwards, we sent people too much money onto the stimulus. We know that we should have done more to address supply chain shortages earlier. Um, and we know as a result that the economy is running too hot and interest rates had to go up. What we don't know is was the three quarter percent increase that the Fed just did enough another quarter point, half point. There are literally the Federal Reserve, if you think about it, is an institution with thousands of employees devoted to basically the question of what should happen to interest incredible. rates. I mean, and it's it's because it's a really hard question. Uh, and, and and we don't know. Uh, and I think that we just have to keep, we have to be nimble. And I think the big, the fundamental thing to keep an eye on, I think if you think about the Summers versus Proven debate is really, is the Fed credibility at risk. That's what it comes down to. What I mean by that's the following. You listen to Powell's statement. If Powell could say to people, we commit, we promise inflation will never go up. We're ju- and so if it gets bad, we're going to take it on. He wouldn't actually necessarily have to raise interest rates now. It's sort of like if he commit that he would raise interest rates that got bad enough, he wouldn't have to. Summer's view is that's an empty promise as you start raising interest rates now. Krugman's view is not necessarily. And that's sort of, but I mean, the Fed credibility, that's not, that, that's sort of like a psychological concept. John, so if we, you know, that, that's a tough spot we're in. If we pursue the Powell strategy, let's assume he's consistent. I, I know you're going to hate this. What's your take on how long the American people have to live with eight, 7% inflation rates? Well, here's, I mean, here's what's very interesting about where we are now, which is that we, the supply chain problems are going to loosen eventually. I mean, uh, you know, I would have thought they would have loosened by now. So my credibility is pretty low. Uh, I, I would have guessed by now they would have loosened. I am still surprised at how little, how, how few people are going back to work, what labor shortage we continue to have, because I would have thought folks would have run through their stimulus money by now. I mean, it was the money it was only 1400 bucks or 1200 bucks. That's, that's going to pay one or two months rent. I, I would have thought everyone would be back to work by now, but it's not happening. So by that logic, I think it's got to be, you know, over the next six months to a year, people have got to go back to work. They got to eat. Um, and the supply chain issues have got to start resolving and the interest rates are up. So I, I, I just I, I, I think it's 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 a year. I don't think it's five years, uh, uh, but I'm an optimistic guy. And what is the recession um, if, if it comes look like? I don't think we're going to have big recession. So what is recession? Recession is when economic growth uh, goes negative, uh, and depending on how long it goes negative for, it can be a recession versus depression. Um, I actually don't know that we're going to have to have much of a recession, and, and 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 here's why: because what happened? Because right now, what happens in 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 a recession is basically interest rates go up, so people stop spending money, so producers have to cut back on production. Well, right now, producers, right now, there's so much more money chasing these goods, the producers don't have to cut back. They got to keep producing as fast as they can. So think of it this way, right now is $1.50 changing every dollar in production. So if, if, if that $1.50 falls to $1.10, are producers going to produce any less aggressively? No, it's still more than a dollar. They still need to make all the treadmills and vacations and everything people want. So I, I don't think there's going to be a huge cutback in production. I don't see a huge recession coming. 
You know, by the way, I, I, when I used to do uh, tax reform stuff, I would ask people in an audience, do you know what a capital gain is? And they would say, no, all I know is I don't have one. <laughs> and it's sort of like if you ask people, how many people in this room here at the library, if I asked you in two sentences to explain what a recession is, could you have done what? No, neither could I. So <laughs> wh what is the difference in the life of somebody listening to the show now today in fairly tough economic times with all the things you mentioned and six months from now if Larry Summers is right and there is a recession? What, so, so basically, we have a minute, by the way. Okay. So the difference is, uh, for every hundred listeners, uh, four of them will be out of four yeah. of them today who have jobs will be out Lose of a job. Your well, jobs. that's not insignificant. Yeah, that's, okay. the, that's, that's not that's insignificant. But, but the politics are fascinating, right? Because at the same time, a hundred percent of your listeners are paying a ton for gas right now. So that's why inflation gets the attention it does. Because even when unemployment goes up, unless it's a depression, yeah. it affects one in, you know, there's one in 25 Americans will be affected by a 4% increase in unemployment. But one in one Americans are uh, affected by paying five bucks a gallon for gas. And that's why inflation gets the attention it does. How do you feel if I told you I actually almost understood what you were saying, John? Does that make you feel good? I, I, I feel almost good. Yeah. <laughs> That yeah. was the goal. You feeling good and yeah, me understanding. Yeah, well, I need a few more lessons, but it's not John, it's me. So that John, was that a was very great. We really appreciate John. it, John Gruber. Yeah, no Thanks. Problem. Thanks. Thank okay. you, as always. Yeah. Happy Fourth of July. You too. John Gruber is the Ford Professor of Economics at MIT. His latest book is Jumpstarting America, How Breakthrough Science Can Revive Economic Growth and the American Dream. Coming up, our national security expert, Juliet Kine, will join us to talk about uh, Biden's latest comments on Roe v. Wade turmoil uh, everywhere, the testimony of Trump aide Cassie, uh, Cassie Hutchinson. I also wanted to mention that at 2 o'clock, if you can stick around, uh, Paris Olson, Callie Crossy, and I are going to be uh, hosting, co-hosting this community conversation on the impact of the Roe decision in Massachusetts and all across the country. So Juliet Kaim is next, and then after that, a community conversation. Great. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. We are broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library. The ruling is in. The U.S. Supreme Court has overturned the constitutional right to an abortion. It reverses Roe v. Wade. Now, let's talk about it. What does this mean for abortion rights in Massachusetts? I'm Marjorie Egan. I'm Callie Crossley. And I'm Paris Alston. We're hosting a community conversation. Join us today starting at 2 here on GBH 89.7. And streaming live at youtube.com slash GBH News. Support for GBH comes from you. And Tools of the Mind, the research and play-based curriculum offers pre-K and K teachers tools designed to help ensure children develop cognitive, social, emotional, and self-regulation skills. Toolsofthemind.org. And Ocean State Job Lot, partnering with customers to provide backpacks to children throughout the Northeast. Learn more at OceanStateJobLot.com. That's OceanStateJobLot.com. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Brody, Marjorie Egan, streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. And we're obviously at the Boston Public Library. We're now joined by national security expert Juliet Kayyem. Juliet is a former assistant secretary for Homeland Security under Barack Obama, the faculty chair of the Homeland Security Program at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Her new book is The Devil Never Sleeps, Learning to Live in an Age of Disasters. Hello there, Juliet. Hello from hey. Rhode Island. We know that. We knew you were going to say that. that we're jealous enough as is. So let's move on. I know. There. I know. <laughs> so, Hi. So Julie Kayyem, uh, it's been a couple of days now since uh, a former aide to Mark Meadows, Trump's chief of staff, Cassidy Hutchinson, kind of riveted the country with her yeah. testimony about uh, President Trump. I want to play you some sound here. Uh, when she was talking about the former president being told some of her supporters were armed at the in Washington that day on the ellipse and that he wanted them uh, at his rally anyway. Was he told again in that conversation that people couldn't come through the mags because they had weapons? Correct. And um, that people 
and he, his response was to say they can march to the Capitol from in, from the ellipse. Something to the effect of take the effing mags away. They're not here to hurt me. Let them in. Let my people in. They can march to the Capitol after the rally's over. They can march from they can march from the ellipse. Take the effing mags away. Then they can march to the Capitol. You know, Juliet, there's been a lot of parsing of what you said, you know, yes. the ketchup story, the uh, attacking the steering wheel and the car by the alleged president. But this part seems to be the yes. the heart of it, the knowledge she claims of the president about weapons. Yeah, this, and, it, and it, there's so many pieces to this. So the first is uh, the, uh, and I think she says it right before, he's, uh, Trump is, uh, telling the Secret Service or, or you know, the, the Park Service at that stage to get rid of the mags, as are the magnometers that are that are doing the 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 search, the gun search. Why does he do that? Because he knows that they're armed. But why also does he do that? Because he wants the picture. This is what becomes clear. He is willing to risk these armed men coming in because he thinks that the ellipse or that area looks doesn't look crowded enough. So mm -hmm. this is a man who is into imagery. So that's the first part, right? Get rid, you know, uh, choose the photo shoot over safety. The second is, of course, the line that will, I think, be, be historical. They're, they're not after me. They're not going to kill me. So what does that mean? It means he has some understanding of the violence that uh, that uh, uh, could ensue or that will ensue, and that he's unperturbed that that violence will might be directed towards someone else because he knows he'll be protected. Those two pieces give me everything I need to make whatever case I want to ma make, which is knowledge of, of, of violence, right? Knowledge of weaponry and knowledge that that could be used for violence. And that's a piece that, that we, you know, I've always believed it and most of us has always believed that this was never spontaneous, but that's about as direct as you can get for, uh, you, you know, it, it, incitement. It's really, it's, it's remarkable. And we're sort of getting stuck on these, I don't want to say that they're side because I think they're actually interesting, but this to me is the piece of, of, yeah, of, of, of incitement that, uh, that we have been lacking to date. Well, you said, I don't want to say it's a side. I do want to say it's a side. No yeah. one, <laughs> nobody is coming forward and saying that what she just said about uh, Trump on this thing is untrue. The whole right. notion, did he grab the steering wheel, did he not? I think most people know that he's mentally unstable. Yeah. So is that true? Is it not true? Did she handwrite the note on the chief of staff stationery, or was it Eric... Uh, whatever his name is, Hirschman, Hirschman that kind of... The bottom yeah. line is the sender piece, as you just said, Juliet, of this testimony is uncontradicted as of the moment by, forget under oath, even not under oath, by even yeah. the most trumped up kinds of supporters. So this is, this is just I amazing. I agree with you. I, 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 I think the, you know, reporters, I love reporters, I hate criticizing them, but I, I think, you know, including ones that I know, I think they got taken for a ride on this story. Then, and the story is, of course, whether in fact Trump lunged for the neck. I, and the reason why I think they got taken for a ride is because, so to speak, the, so to speak, is the, the Secret Service members who are countering it. One of them left the Secret Service to be Deputy Chief of Staff. I know a pure exactly. And he apparently, or at least the commission has, the committee has disclosed. He said he had no recollection of what happened in the car. If he wants to testify under oath that he now exactly remembers, right. right? Now he's now he's re-remembering, as everyone will soon, um, uh, uh, that there was no neck grabbing. He is free to do so. And this is, I guess, another piece. I thought, you know, I thought, what day was it? Did it happen Tuesday? I thought, I, I thought. It was just amazing. Each time, I think it can't get more amazing, professional, <clears throat> interesting, jaw-dropping. And this one really was, because at the end of it, it you know, when, and, and not to be forgotten, is when, when Cheney posts the emails of essentially a, a mafia Witness going intimidation after, stuff. Yeah, yeah, we discussed that with Andrew Cabral earlier. Yeah, yeah, it's just unbelievable. You I mean, it's, it's, it is literally out of Mafia 101. So uh, I think we'll hear from more people. Uh, there's been a subpoena issued to the White House Counsel, who's been circulating in the background for a while. So, you know, on that note, uh, I, I, I talk about press. The fact that any press person fell for the notion that Ginny Thomas 
<laughs> wanted to clear her name I before know. the committee. Idiots said that. I hope I didn't. And number no. two, this notion, you know, you juxtapose this 26-year-old woman uh, testifying and probably with a colossal number of threats with the fact oh, that God. General Flynn is taking the fifth when asked the question about whether or not he believes in the uh, peaceful, peaceful trans transfer uh, for of power. And you have Cipollone needing, the White House counsel, needing a subpoena. You know, what happened to your patriotic obligation yeah, well, to tell I the keep, American people I, the damn truth. I keep, we between the impeachment hearings and this hearing, I keep saying, man up, you know? I exactly, mean, I like, exactly. Oh, it's I women. Like it's, I it's know, because women it's women that who are coming forward. That, themselves. Yeah, oh, like the Georgia, just, women. Georgia women. Yeah. Georgia women and Liz Cheney. The Georgia yeah, women and Liz Cheney. Liz Cheney and, um, but even think about um, Fiona Hill yep. uh, and She's others great. who came forward Maria to Yvonovich. say. Yeah, exactly. So yep. it's just, you know, it's it's remarkable, but uh, but you're exactly right. But the the you know, here's what was what was interesting or you know great about the end of the committee hearing is they're basically saying we know more than you think we know, and if you want to gamble, mm -hmm. go ahead. But this you know this this ship is sinking. This boat is sailing. Whatever you want to say. You know, as I as I wrote a couple of weeks ago, you do not want to be the last one on this boat, right? Like, I mean, you know, you won't be the first one off. You do not want to be the last. So I, I just have a question. You two are attorneys. I am not. Um, there, there are many subpoenas being issued here to speak yeah. before the committee and many of them being ignored. If I'm subpoenaed uh, <laughs> to the Suffolk courthouse, do I have to go or can I just say nah? Well, you can challenge it. So they're not it's not that they're ignoring them. They are challenging them either based on jurisdiction by the committee that the committee doesn't have jurisdiction or some privilege, mm -hmm. right? So the attorney-client privilege, marital privilege, whatever it is. Um, and so that's what's happening. So it's not like they're like throwing it in the trash. Okay. They're just saying, I'm not going to adhere to it. And But the, the benefit of the subpoena, rather than saying, will you come in, is it then starts that legal process so that you can try to get someone in. Uh, they might plead the fifth, as Flynn did, uh, but you're at least you you've got them in hand. So By the you way, know, you know, I'm sorry, but speaking ahead. of subpoenas, you know the notion that they're subpoenaing Cipollone in July or June when he's going to fight the subpoena, despite the fact that we're now hearing they could cut a deal in terms of a transcribed interview. But if he fights the subpoena, it's not going to be resolved until after the elections. Why didn't they subpoena the chief White yeah. House counsel yeah. four months ago? I mean, they're doing yeah. a great job in the hearings, it, but in, in any case, it just... No, no, it may be, and I'll, I'll go get back to Ginny Thomas, yeah. but it may be you don't have that to. part of it is just sort of that snowball effect that, that that what you know that that the more they have i'm not defending them because i'm getting a little bit worried about the clock too but the more they have the 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 better the interview is i mean and that's i think essentially what happened on tuesday is that as they started to get cumulative information of what happened they they were like okay we're going to come out here with sort of the day of because remember that was an emergency or right but they had a special. lot of her testimony I know, before. from the four depositions right. can we move on from the hearing because we have yes. some other stuff uh, yeah. at the right before the show started today marjorie and i watched uh, Joe Biden to his press conference at the end yeah. of the G7. And we want to talk to you briefly about foreign policy implications there. But before we do, it was a very significant... After Kamala Harris was interviewed the other day by your colleague Donna Bash at CNN yeah. and danced for five minutes about whether or not the administration would support a carve-out from the filibuster to pass, to codify the protections yeah. in row that were just overturned by the Supreme Court. Uh, Joe Biden was asked the question today about that at this conference at the end of the G7. Here's what President Biden okay. had to say. I believe we have to codify Roe v. Wade in the law. And the way to do that is to make sure the Congress votes to do that. And if the filibuster gets in the way, it's like voting rights. It should be we provide an exception for this, for the, except the require an exception to the filibuster for this action to deal with the Supreme Court decision. You know, the, and, and the, the Harris thing, if people didn't see the interview, this crap that, well, we don't need to answer, she essentially said, I don't have to answer the question. She didn't say yeah. those words because we don't have the votes. Now, by uh, Biden doing the right thing on the carve out, uh, he doesn't have the power. He just, it's a bully pulpit. Yeah. He puts the pressure on the, even Joe Manchin, who doesn't like carve outs, he says he felt deceived by Kavanaugh, right. even though he is anti-choice, he said he felt the leave, uh, deceived that Roe was the law of the land, in which case put pressure on this character, on this senator, to uh, do a carve-out yeah. to atone 
for him allowing himself to be duped. I mean, this is a major Big moment deal. for Biden and good no, for I, him. Yeah, no, I agree. And um, and I mean, please deceive Susan Collins. Come I know. I mean, I can't exactly. Even. I mean, these people, these these justices were are were groomed for this moment. There's been no other legal moment that they particularly care about except for getting rid of Roe and and the you know the 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 um how do I even say this? Like the stories are already horrifying. I, I, I literally cannot believe that this, you know, you sort of think this happened. So of course you're going to uh, codify it and, and this is good for Biden, but I, I will agree with you on the vice president. Um, I don't know what they're doing to her. I saw that interview. Oh, horrible. Oh, horrible. My, I mean, well, it's her either. She, it, it just, you you cannot be like that as the vice president. It's it's it, it is it is infantilizing the way she talks now. And I don't know if she's been like, you know, like criticized so much that she doesn't feel natural. I don't know if or if she's she told she can't say anything, in which case I don't, know. don't do don't the interview. Do the right. Exactly. exactly. At this juncture it, to it say put that, her yeah. behind on the issues that she should that she should be at the forefront of, which is, of course, exactly you know, the Roe v. Wade and the legal issues. And now right? Biden and she, makes her look like a fool because oh, Biden just, does answer the question. Yeah. You know, can I ask one Val more? Val Demings. He should have picked Val Demings. Well, whatever. Can I, I, can I pick <laughs> one? Uh, do just one more G7 thing, yeah. uh, if I may, I, I, just briefly. It's nice that the United States is leading the way towards this $4.5 billion thing for hunger around the world because sunflower oil and wheat is obviously in short supply because of what's happening yeah. in Russia, by Russia towards Ukraine. The Russian oil thing, fine. Finland and Sweden adding to NATO, right. fine. I, I followed this fairly closely. The Ukrainians are getting slaughtered. Their yeah. infrastructure is getting totally destroyed. What did the G7 nations do in this conference to make life any better or more hopeful and the for the Ukrainians. And the sanctions have not worked at all. Well, at least some are not working. Well, that, the ones that we no, have today not, haven't, haven't worked. That's not totally true. I mean, they defaulted. Russia defaulted on, um, and so um, on uh, its monetary obligations. And so, I mean, I, I so I think that's right. So, so I agree with you. We we anticipated. I mean, all but we, the military analysts who were realistic that the early victories by the Ukrainians were likely to result mm -hmm. in a long slog in eastern uh, Ukraine, uh, where the border is with Russia, that that is, in fact, what's happening. And exactly what you're saying, that this is a, uh, you know, this is, um, you know, a, I don't know what it is, you know, the, the, the equivalent is just sort of this violence, horrible life for the Ukrainians. But meanwhile, there are there are areas where people are returning, right? So there's like this, this you know, it's a big country. There's a lot going on. And the NATO allies and and the EU are do not want to be dragged into that long slog, except through diplomatic means. There, I think they're willing to you know figure out how, how they can get a resolution if there is any resolution. Um, and that that won't change weaponry, notwithstanding, that's not likely to change. No, neither of the armies is sufficiently strong or sufficiently weak to make it, yeah. you know, a day. Oh, you know, it's going to be over in a day. So that's the problem. So then, of course, so then you're doing so then we focus on the downstream impacts, which are uh, which are uh, how is this impacting uh, starvation and food supply and and uh, and other supplies in the world, which it which it is impacting, given both Russia and Ukraine's um, uh, influence, say in the grain in, in grain distribution, uh, things like NATO and NATO uh, membership, which is which is not to be, I mean it, it's huge. I mean the fact that these countries want to come in, that Turkey is now folded. Uh, he he made he Turkey made, was opposing Finland and Sweden yeah, so coming made, in, and they dropped so Putin their opposition. Made, made, yeah. made this alliance, which had always been a little, you know, which had been prickly over the last couple decades, uh, much stronger. But I agree with you that. But there's still a war going on. There's still a war. And the yeah. other problem is because in this country, and I'm not blaming the media for this, because of the Supreme Court's destruction of a whole host of rights, because of the January 6th hearing, Americans' attention 
is turning yeah. away from this, which I think puts far less pressure on our leaders to do what we should be Although doing to help fairness, the Ukrainians. Although in I still see a lot about this on, 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 on the news. It's not leading the news at a particular juncture. You're right. But, You're right. But it's some. still there. So, um, uh, Juliet Kime, our national security expert, uh, you used to be at the Department of Homeland Security. I, I, there was something kind of disjointed to me about a DHS now coming out warning about uh, domestic violence extremism yeah. in the wake of the... Uh, uh, Supreme Court decision about Roe v. Wade, I guess because, okay, I, I understand there's been some arson at a pregnancy center and there was obviously the threat against Justice Kavanaugh, but I have never, I've been to a lot of marches in my life yeah. as a reporter and protests, war protests. There has been nothing more peaceful in my life and less oh threatening God. and calmer as the protests of women the day after yeah. uh, President Trump was inaugurated. So do they always issue these remarks? No, uh, yeah, it, was, it was, yes. Okay, so let me say yes on the, you know, they're always issuing reports on the threat environment. Have things changed? They, they had issued a report when the, when the opinion leaked uh, because of the elevated concern, and there were, uh, there was a, a, a major arrest outside near Kavanaugh's house of someone who clearly wanted to harm him, if not kill him. So I want to be uh, fair and focused on yep. on what was the legitimate threat environment. Okay, that that we get. So then the opinion comes down, and DHS, as if nothing has happened in between, right, re sort of reissues it in the most both sided intelligence you know uh, um, uh, uh, document bulletin like as if both sides are equal which is not right. consistent with reality and so i'm like what i was so upset by it because okay because a couple things one is we saw over the weekend what we knew was going to happen which is pro-life or anti-choice activists mostly men who who are pushing the envelope, the, th the idea that they're done with their end of row is ridiculous. They want a federal ban on abortion. So in states that are where it's contentious, but it's still allowed in states that still have exceptions for incest and, and, uh, and health of the mother or for blue states that have full access, that's where they're going to focus because the, they want, and Pence, one of their leaders, former Vice President Pence, wants the federal ban and we're not there yet right it's it, 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 the, the 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 opinion still allows for federalism so that's for secondly and i'm just going to say this the idea that the the anti-choice movement can be separated from the violence that was not condoned but that was i think i would call it a an offshoot of the last 50 years of anti-choice activism is ridiculous. Doctors were killed. Yeah. Abortion clinics were bombed. Here. Women were right harassed. Here. Yeah, this is not, this is not like, oh, we're making it up. Like, oh, we don't like, you know, we don't like anti-choice people. Like this is the reality of the anti-choice movement. And I will tell you, I, I try to listen, I try to, my feelings are probably not a surprise, but I, I, I understand and I think that there are legitimate voices in the anti-choice movement uh, that, that should be listened to. People like David French, other, other people's are, you know, strong, strong religious voices, uh, David French for the Atlantic and the Dispatch. But to write article after article about this, and yep. to never mention the doctors that were killed and the clinics that were bombed and the women day in and day out were, who were harassed. Harassed. It's disingenuous. And the people it's who were harassed at their homes because they worked at the clinics and people yeah. who had to go there yeah. in bulletproof vests yeah. because exactly. they were afraid of being murdered, that, who had to be escorted to the parking garages because yeah. they were afraid of being murdered. I mean, really. It, it, and, 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 and juxtapose that to the violence we've all been talking about on January 6th. Yeah, I, I, it's just it implies it's a, it's that these a, women, that these women are going to be out there uh, yeah. perpetrating now, I will extreme say violence. A, yeah, there's there's a there's a new group that p people are interested, but it's not, you know, these new groups form and like, you know, they're not well funded. They're not well organized. They're not, you know, that's doing graffiti. It's called um, so far or maybe some breaking of windows. It's called uh, Jane's Revenge. It's, yeah. a, it's a pro choice group. It's relatively new. But to, to compare them to the you know, politically endorsed 
anti-choice movement, and I want to I want to be clear again that has an offshoot. It's not them, right? That has that has benefited, or at least you know has, has not condemned the violence behind it. Is 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 just so hypocritical. I mean, it's just hypocritical uh, and uh, and worth calling out. So I don't know. I was very. I was like you. I was like, if you're going to do an intelligence bulletin, be 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 honest, like this is crazy, both sidesism. Everyone's upset. Yeah, everyone's yeah. upset, but only one side is like kill doctors. Like, well, you, you know, know, before you go though, I just want to re react quickly to your saying there are some legitimate voices, religious voices maybe deserve to be heard. Being heard and having an influence on the debate, uh, I don't see what the other side of this is. I understand yeah. religious well, objections. Here's their problem. When it comes to personal freedom of women in this country, but here's their problem, and this is true with with, with, with the, with the anti-abortion side, is that they don't do the support for things oh like God. Build Back Better. They don't do support for the babies. They don't that give are a born. damn about they the kids. Damn. So when they, they start don't. talking about the, the, we have plenty of work to do now. Well, where were they lobbying for Biden's bill? Well, I also thing? did a segment last night with a head, a former Globe reporter, who's now running this national adoption thing, and a woman. Oh who uh, 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 was given up for adoption by her mother yeah. uh, and has had an abortion later in life, this whole BS starting with Coney Barrett about yeah. how uh, adoption, and I'm both my kids are adopted, by the way, yeah. is, is a suitable a replacement yeah. or substitute for abortion is the biggest pile of crap yeah. ever. So in if any that, case... If that, if that were true, we'd have no foster care system, right? <laughs> I mean, the idea that, that, the idea that demand is bigger than potential supply. And I'm talking- No, you're totally I'm right. Talking, I'm talking market talk because that's how the Supreme Court talked. What do they call it? The supply of babies. Supply, exactly yeah. right. Supply of babies. So it is It is so disingenuous, but the, the horror that we're about to see, um, it's not sustainable. I mean, in other words, the, the idea that the court thinks that we're done is ridiculous because every permutation of this now is going to be litigated. The 13-year-old Well, was well except, by... let's go back to the first thing we said to you. If the Susan Collinses of the world oh, and God. the mansions man and woman up and carve out an exception to the filibuster and adopt the same thing that Nancy Pelosi has gotten through the House, the Women's Health Protection Act, then they do codify Roe v. Right. Wade and we have a different outcome. Juliet, we got to go. It's great to see you. Enjoy great to Rhode see you Island. Guys. Take hey, care. Thank you very much. Have a great vacation, Juliet. Thank be well, you. Juliet. Bye. I guess she's Bye. not really on vacation, though, if she's talking to us, but well, that's okay. Whatever. <laughs> We're glad she carved out an exception for us, A little Jim. tan, you notice okay, the Okay, yeah, she has too. a beautiful tan. Thank you, Juliet. We've been speaking with Juliet Kayyem, former Assistant Secretary for Homeland Security under President Barack Obama and the faculty chair of the Homeland Security Program at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Her new book, I love this title, The Devil Never Sleeps, Learning to Live in an Age of Disasters. Uh, we are done. Thanks for listening to us today. Keep up with us 24-7 by way of a podcast. Tomorrow we're going to be joined by poet Billy Collins, Chris Kimball from America's Test, Test Kitchen, Joanne Chang, the chef and author, Susan Orlean. And please stick around for the next 60 minutes. Callie Crossley, Paris Austin, and I will host Take Your Calls on a community conversation on the future of abortion rights in the United States of America. Our crew is Zoe Matthews, Aidan Conley, Mackenzie Farkas, Rebecca Tauber. Our engineer is John LeClaw Parker. Our executive producer is Jamie Bologna. Our library engineers are Sai Patel, Colin Cockrell, and Rob Fagnett. Jim Browdy, you're not on television. I am actually, but thank you very well, you much are. for asking. Oh. Maybe I am not, and I didn't <laughs> know, but I believe I am. Number one, I should say, when you tease tomorrow's show, we are not at the library tomorrow. We are, Even though it's a Friday, yep, thank you. we're not at the library, so please, you can come to the library, but don't show up for us. Uh, one, we're going to continue the discussion of what impact this uh, Supreme Court decision on the EPA and regulation is going to have on the climate, on the environment. And secondly, as you know, uh, at noon today was the end of uh, Justice Breyer's term of the Supreme Court. I interviewed him a couple of years ago about a variety of things, including whether there should be term limits on justices. We're going to replay that discussion I had with uh, now former Justice Breyer tonight as well. It's 7 o'clock, and I am showing up for TV. Excellent. Despite Marjorie trying to discourage you Sorry. from watching. He'll be there, 7 o'clock. He will. Too. He will. I'm Marjorie Egan. I'm Jim Browdy. Thanks so much for tuning in today. Hope you have a great day. See you later. We're Boston's local NPR, but we also travel well. Download the GBH app to listen to the radio and submit stories, tips, pictures, or video to the GBH newsroom from anywhere. Bring us on your journeys with the GBH app. Funding for our programs comes from you 
and Comcast Business, offering Security Edge, an internet security solution that helps block threats like malware, ransomware, phishing, and botnet attacks across all connected devices. Restrictions apply. ComcastBusiness.com. Hercule Poirot believes that he's a better investigator than the police. And to tell you the truth, he might just be right. Don't miss Agatha Christie's Poirot, tonight at 9 on GBH44. Trusted. Local. News. This is 89.7 WGBH. WGBH HD1 Boston. Online at gbhnews.org. Boston's local NPR. The Supreme Court today ruled that abortion is completely a private matter to be decided by mother and doctor in the first three months of pregnancy. One of the most consequential Supreme Court decisions in history has brought nearly 50 years of federal abortion rights to an end. I am angry. I am angry because I have lived in an America where there was no protection from Roe versus Wade. This great nation can now live up to its core principle that all are created equal, not born equal, created equal. We could be talking about forced birth in a country that does not have paid leave, that does not have childcare. What is in this ruling? What will it mean for the people of Massachusetts? And what protections do our current laws provide? People in Massachusetts cannot get comfortable. It's not like people in Massachusetts can look and say, well, you know, we're not Texas, we're not Louisiana, we're okay. The people who have spent decades trying to overturn Roe v. Wade see daylight now. Today's historic Supreme Court decision is a victory for the sanctity of life. It will save countless innocent children. As clinics cancel appointments in states with new abortion bans, will Massachusetts become a beacon for abortion access? And what other rights could be at risk now that Roe v. Wade has been undone? This Supreme Court has overturned Roe, and with that, put in question other things as well. Marriage equality, contraception. Who knows where this ends? Join us for a special broadcast as we talk through the reverberations of this historic Supreme Court ruling. We'll look at the legal implications, we'll talk through the status of abortion access and reproductive rights in Massachusetts, and we'll be having this conversation with you, hearing your stories and answering your questions along the way. A community conversation on the overturning of Roe is next on 89.7 GBH and streaming live on youtube.com slash GBH news. Welcome to Community Conversation, Row Overturned. We are live on 89.7 GBH and streaming on youtube.com slash GBH News. Broadcasting from our GBH studio here at the Boston Public Library. I'm joined by my colleagues Paris Alston, co-host of Morning Edition, and Marjorie Egan, co-host of Boston Public Radio. We're gathering to talk through the reverberations of the Supreme Court's historic ruling that has overturned Roe v. Wade. We'll be talking through what the decision means for the people of Massachusetts, what this means for reproductive rights, and the vulnerable communities who will be hit the hardest. The 6-3 decision in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization means that states will be able to make their own laws around abortion. As of today, abortion is now banned in at least seven states, with trigger bans in several more set to take effect. Joining us to talk through the decision is law professor Renee Landers. She is the faculty director of the Health and Biomedical Law Concentration and the Masters of Science in Law Life Sciences Program at Suffolk University Law School. Renee Landers, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me as part of this conversation. Now, this is a conversation that we are also having with you. We want to hear how this ruling will affect you. What questions and concerns do you have now that Roe v. Wade has been overturned? We want to hear from all points of view. We welcome all points of view. If you support abortion, if you are anti-abortion, if you are conflicted about the overturning of Roe v. Wade, give us a call or text us at 877-301-8970. 877-301-8970. You can tweet us at GBH News, 
If you're here in the audience at the Boston Public Library, you can ask a question too by alerting our colleague, Rebecca Talbert. All right, Renee, let's start off this way. I want everybody to be on the same page. We've all heard the decision. Uh, Roe v. Wade was overturned, but there was a case brought to the Supreme Court, uh, which was the vehicle by which the court decided to overturn Roe v. Wade. So first, exactly what does the ruling say? So the, um, the case that was uh, uh, the that generated the Supreme Court's decision in this case was brought um, by the state of Mississippi. Uh, uh, well, it actually was uh, initiated by a, a women's health clinic in Jackson, Mississippi against the Mississippi law that um, uh, prohibits abortion after 15 weeks of pregnancy, of gestation during a pregnancy. Um, under the Roe v. Wade in uh, Planned Parenthood versus Casey precedents, um, the constitutional rule was that abortion had to be available um, without an undue burden until fetal viability, which right now is at about 23 or 24 weeks gestation. So Mississippi was actually, you know, uh, passed this law deliberately to try to test that viability standard in Roe and Casey. Um, and so uh, the Supreme Court uh, accepted the case for review um, after the lower federal court um, overturned, invalidated the statute, said it was invalid under Supreme Court precedents. And the Supreme Court accepted the case for review on the question of whether this 15 week, um, uh, this ban starting at 15 weeks was constitutional. Uh, but um, as the case evolved, uh, many people in Mississippi itself, the state of Mississippi got on the bandwagon of urging the court to use this case as a vehicle for just scrapping the right to uh, the constitutional right to abortion entirely. And with the, um, uh, you know, conservative, uh, uh, the heavy uh, conservative uh, weight of the Supreme Court, uh, the justices had six, uh, well, actually five votes to abandon the Roe Casey um, you know, uh, uh, regime and uh, protection for abortion rights. Uh, and then the sixth vote was Chief Justice Roberts, who said he would have upheld the Mississippi statute, uh, but just changed, uh, you know, moved the kind of uh, the baseline from the 23, 24 weeks fetal viability point to 15 weeks and upheld the Mississippi statute. So his approach was a more modest uh, revision of the Casey and Roe framework. So what does that mean exactly, uh, 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 John, Chief Justice John Roberts' comment there? Um, will it have any legal impact at all? Because in the end, he joined with the majority. But what does, usually when there is a dissent or a comment made along with a ruling, that's a signal uh, that has meaning down the road potentially. So what does his statement mean? Well, um, you know, I think it doesn't mean very much in this context. I think that, you know, he um, has been, um, you know, argued that the judiciary should have some modesty in overturning legislative uh, enacted statutes or in um, overturning precedents. And so I think that he was trying to take, uh, you know, uphold the law, which respects the legislature's enactment in Mississippi but at the same time, respect the fundamental precedent in Casey and Roe that um, there was a right to abortion uh, up to a certain point during a pregnancy. So as a moderate, but um, I think that he, um, you know, the, you know, some the, some of the abortion rights advocates had hoped that at a minimum that that position would be the worst case scenario in the decision in the Dobbs case. Uh, but he, Chief Justice Roberts, was obviously not able to bring along um, the other conservative members of the court to that point of view because they were bent uh, on, on overturning Roe and Casey. Also, in the majority, of course, Clarence Thomas. And he took a moment to make a separate statement as well. Again, what does that mean or could mean potentially? Um, I read, and I think many commentators read, that uh, Justice Thomas's statement. Uh, that, First, let's say uh, what he said. Yes, <laughs> I will say what he said. Okay, that, great. That he, um, uh, his, his view was that uh, he joined the majority opinion because he thinks it was the right result. Um, he, uh, for many, many years, 
has um, disliked and expressed his profound dislike for the Supreme Court's jurisprudence in this whole area of um, substantive due process rights, which is where uh, in, in constitutional doctrine, the right to abortion sits. But also sitting in that area are the rights uh, to uh, same-sex marriage, the right to use contraception. Uh, and so um, uh, he was arguing in his concurrence, he agreed with the result because it was consistent you know, with uh, you know, his view of what substantive due process should allow. Uh, but he was urging the court to revisit all those other precedents that were decided under the same doctrine. So um, I think it's a shopping list for people to begin challenging these other, you know, the same sex marriage, uh, the right to contraception. So I think that that's why people are expressing, um, you know, concern over what might happen in the future. Uh, one case that he didn't raised to be revisited as interracial marriage. He happens to be in one, but according to the list that he uh, put in, the, in his uh, statement, that too would fall in the category as he uh, has determined that some of these cases need to be revisited. Is that right? Yes, um, yes, up to a point. But the um, Loving v. Virginia is the interracial marriage case. And that case um, was based on two different constitutional foundations. One was the Equal Protection Clause, and the other one was the Due Process Clause. So, yes, you're right that the reasoning, uh, you know, related to the Due Process Clause, you know, might go by the wayside if the court decides to review these other precedents. But there's still that equal protection po a component under Loving v. Virginia. Uh, but I guess the, one of the larger points I would make here, this is a good opportunity to make this point. Um, the Dobbs decision, the, court, the majority opinion uh, by Justice Alito in Dobbs uh, rests a lot of the rationale on um, that the rights protected in the Constitution either have to be specifically stated in the Constitution or they have to be found in the history and traditions of the country. Um, that's an inherently backward looking approach to the evolution of the law. Um, there is no, um, and I've always disliked this test for that reason. And even the very first Chief Justice of the United States, John Marshall said, you know, we're, we're interpreting a constitution that's supposed to be adaptable to the crises and changes in human experience. And that history and tradition test um, does not allow the Constitution to evolve with the times. And I think that because of that rationale, if the court were to apply it to the Equal Protection Clause, even a case like Loving would be at risk. Hmm. All right, look, can any calls, Marjorie? Uh, yes, we, we, uh, we have a Daniel from Marlboro who's calling. He's a veteran in support of choice. Daniel, thank you very much for calling. What's, what's up? Hello, thank you for taking my call. Uh, long time listener, first time caller. I really appreciate, appreciate you letting me uh, speak my piece. And thanks for calling. Um, so I'm, I'm a veteran, I'm a combat veteran. I served in Iraq and Afghanistan. I've bled for this country. I've watched friends die just to come back to watch half of the population lose the constitutional rights I swore to protect. Um, the 4th of July for me is canceled. Instead of fireworks, I will be joining thousands of other veterans and burning my uniforms in protest. And I want <clears throat> the, uh, the women that are listening to know, veterans, stand with you. We support you. Or we will fight with you. If you have a protest planned and you don't feel safe, reach out to Wall of Vets. They have provided security for pro-choice protests in the past. Um, where where is this happening, Daniel? You. Where is this burning of the uniforms happening? What are you talking about? This is mostly done online on private social media accounts, shared across TikTok, Facebook, Instagram. Um, you can find thousands of, of veterans that have already done so, and more will be doing so on 4th of July. Thank you very much for the call, Daniel. And we have a question here at the Boston Public Library. Is Alette, and I came down here especially to offer the adoptee perspective. Um, I am an adoptee from the baby scoop era, and I'll tell you that our adoptee friends are not doing well right now. Um, I'm an adoptee and a rape survivor, and even 
with all of that, I am pro-choice. Uh, I don't think people consider the trauma of a baby being removed from their mother. Um, normally, a baby and their mother, there's self-soothing by the mother. But if the baby's taken away right away, the baby has to learn how to self-soothe. And studies, and there are true studies out there that show elevated cortisol levels, um, babies need, needing to self-soothe, and that can lead down the road to addiction levels being a lot higher in adoptees. Depression is a lot higher, increased suicidality, ADD. And I want to make sure to say that I was adopted into a home uh, with a lot of money, a lot of opportunity, excellent education. I had love, but all of the love and all of the money doesn't negate that initial trauma. And um, I feel lucky to have been in a good home, but even then, I have suffered depression, suicidality, and it doesn't help also that I'm a veterinarian, so that's a higher rate of suicidality. <laughs> but anyway, thank you so much for having this open conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you well, for thank sharing. You for sharing. Thank that you so much for much for sharing that. So we should point out that one of the chief, ju one of the justices on the Supreme Court, Amy Coney Barrett, mm -hmm. uh, who's a mother of seven, two of them adopted. Uh, in her confirmation hearings seemed to imply that it was not a big deal for a woman yeah. who has an unwanted pregnancy to just go through adoption and give the baby away. You're belying uh, that mm -hmm. in what you said to us today. It's, it the, is the a other, huge deal. And the other thing too, um, being a transracial adoptee adopted into a white family, that is a whole other can of worms. Oh, okay. and, just because an adoptee is uh, not doing well or suffering depression has nothing to do with lack of love. There's, there's more to it. Thank you. Thank you very that. much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you for sharing that. That's Renee, really you wanted great. to add something? Yeah, I wanted, I wanted to say that um, these, uh, both of these comments have been very um, compelling and very moving to me. I mean, I'm the daughter of a, 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 a 20 plus year veteran of the US Army. So I really do uh, appreciate the devotion of any members of the military to supporting constitutional rights. I also think that the second comment about um, adoption not being just this complete panacea um, is really important because the court, in the opinion in Dobbs, uh, really overlooked uh, the difficulties uh, that women experience in pregnancy and that and in the uh, and in raising children. And that, um, you know, just because, you know, the law uh, happens to prohibit discrimination against pregnancy or against people with children and employment and whatnot, doesn't mean it doesn't happen and doesn't mean it's still a very challenging um, thing to do, um, especially if the person uh, did not want to be a parent. And so I think that uh, the court has this kind of Pollyanna-ish view of uh, you know what what um, pregnancy is like, and they just don't respect um, that there is uh, you know that there are other interests involved other than protecting fetal life um, that are involved in this question of abortion. Kelly, if I could, I want to pick up on what the the first caller said mentioning that the 4th of July is canceled for him, right? Mm -hmm. There is an error of patriotism that is permeating this Supreme Court decision and or lack thereof, I mean, this, this sentiment that our values are not settled, let alone our laws at this point as we're seeing. So Renee, I'm wondering from you, how does a legal system and one with such power as the Supreme Court interpret the law when even, when you're talking about law based on values, we don't even really have a consensus on what our values are right now. Well, that, that's a really excellent question, which is why, um, you know, and I think that there have been uh, several cases this term decided by the court, which uh, really raised that, bring that question to the fore. Uh, you know, the case earlier this week about, uh, you know, prayer by, uh, you know, a high school uh, football coach, um, all these sorts of things seem to be reverting to this kind of 1950s notion that we're a Christian nation and that we the values should be traditional ones where, you know, women, uh, you know, their primary job was to uh, have and raise children and uh, worry about the home sector and not be um, so concerned with, you know, their role in the world. Now, um, and so I think that, um, uh, you know, people do have very, you know, different views about values, but the important thing about the law and what Roe um, allowed 
was for people to make their own choices about which values they would prefer. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, if, if a woman wanted to, you know, primarily have the role as a wife and, uh, and caretaker for children, great. Um, if a woman wanted to have some other role, role uh, Roe allowed that possibility um, more so than the, than, you know, the regime we're looking at will allow. And so um, I think it's very hard for the court um, to, you know, come down on one side or another about these values. And um, uh, the Alito decision also seemed to think that Roe had caused controversy, and by eliminating Roe, the con controversy would go away. Well, as we've seen, even since the decision, um, it's, it's going to this elimination of Roe and the actions of states in trying to prohibit abortion, trying to prohibit their citizens from leaving the state to obtain abortions, trying to prohibit their citizens from getting medication abortions. Uh, you know, through the mail or however, um, this will spawn more litigation that uh, likes of which the court has not seen. So um, it, it, it's sort of in a way like the Dred Scott case where the Supreme Court thought it was going to solve this sort of slavery rights question once and for all, and the result of which was the Civil War. So I think, um, you know, I'm not predicting war here necessarily, but I, I do think that the, the controversy is going to only be exacerbated because of this and because the court um, refused uh, to um, take the position on, of neutrality with respect to values, as you were suggesting, Paris. And from a legal standpoint, Renee, when is settled law settled then? Um, I think this whole experience that uh, we've, we've had with this Dobbs case and some of the um, cases, um, you know, about the ability of the government to uh, 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 impose public health measures, you know, in response to the pandemic, uh, raise a serious question. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, the, um, it, it, that, that it's hard to know what the answer to that question is uh, anymore if um, every court, uh, you know, that has a shifting majority can uh, come along and change these very longstanding precedents. Now, you know, I know that the conservatives think that, well, Roe was wrong, so we were justified. But um, actually, I wanted to point out that there's a, another there, in addition to the concurrence uh, that Thomas wrote with his little shopping list of other rights that he'd like to see eliminated, um, there is a footnote in the main opinion, uh, footnote 48, which lists all these um, cases which overturn prior court precedents. Mm. I think that's another shopping list by the court. Mm. And um, on that list are cases like Brown versus Board of Education, which is never quite settled in comfortably. It's sort of like Roe, we all nod, oh yes, you know, uh, you know, race discrimination and segregation is unlawful. But you know, a, a lot of people are not happy with that. Mm. And so, um, so I think there's another longer shopping list. Um, one last case I will note is um, uh, the the, you know, the Miranda decision. You know your yeah. Miranda rights. You have a right to be silent. You know if you're arrested, you don't have to uh, be a witness against yourself. Well, um, this the week that the court decided Dobbs, it decided another case in which it weakened the the right to uh, have uh, things that you would say without your Miranda warnings used against you in a trial. So I I think that a lot of rights are at risk and that nothing right now is particularly settled law with this court. Um, President Biden this morning was uh, at a press conference in NATO. Uh, he agrees with you. Here he is addressing the Supreme Court overruling Roe v. Wade. The one thing that has been destabilizing is the outrageous behavior of the Supreme Court of the United States on overruling not only Roe v. Wade, but essentially challenging the right to privacy. We've been a leader in the world in terms of personal rights and privacy rights. And it is a mistake, in my view, for the Supreme Court to do what it did. Uh, yeah, you guys could show me which call we're going to go to next. But meanwhile, we have a call from a woman, a uh, text from a woman who's older and talks about how uh, when she was 10 years old, and she's 75, so she grew up way before uh, uh, Roe. When I was 10 years old, my, my good friend's 16-year-old sister died. She was so fun and outgoing and smart and pretty. When I got older, I found out she was the victim of an illegal abortion. As I overheard the ruling today, well, it wasn't today, but when it came down a few days back, I found myself crying for her all over again. I feel many more women will die 
um, from illegal abortions. Th that's the other thing that I wondered about, the medical mm -hmm. abortion and mm -hmm. where that will fit in uh, in preventing people from doing what they used to do with uh, back alley so-called abortions. Mm -hmm. Renee, uh, medical abortions, I think, are about half of all of the abortions. Uh, some of that uh, increased during the time of COVID particularly. Mm -hmm. But as we know, that's been banned in certain states. We should say, as I haven't said, just to be clear, abortion is legal in Massachusetts. Correct. Um, and there have been two steps since uh, the Roe v. Wade decision came down to shore up the legality in uh, Massachusetts. One is an executive order by uh, Charlie Baker, our governor, and another, last night, the House voted with even more specific kinds of... Um, uh, points that they wanted to make to make sure that uh, gender non-conforming folks um, a as well as um, women are not deterred from have being able to get an abortion in Massachusetts. There's funding available, there's insurance. There's a lot of details that are on the table now. The Senate has, to, has a version of it. They'll reconcile and we'll see that. But my point is this. Um, uh, one of the things that is, is, is right in the center, it seems to me, of legality is this uh, tele, telemedicine, medical abortions, legal in Massachusetts, but we are expecting an influx of people from across, uh, from other states. Are we protected legally, or can we be protected legally? Well, yeah, I mean, this, the, the, all of these measures that you just um, listed, Callie, are intended to, um, to add some protections. Um, among them are to, um, protect uh, uh, abortion providers, healthcare providers in Massachusetts uh, from, uh, be, uh, from uh, lawsuits by um, people from out of state, um, you know, who are uh, uh, challenging, uh, you know, the provision of a service that's, as you noted, legal in Massachusetts. If someone from Texas, say, comes to Massachusetts and obtains an abortion under Texas law, um, that person uh, could be could be prosecuted, or anyone who helped them could be prosecuted. I.e., in theory, the abortion provider in Massachusetts, and so all of these laws are intended to try to protect providers from those kinds of, um, you know, really uh, nuisance lawsuits um, from people in these other states. Um, the um, the problem is you still might have to defend them, and so um, so the but the law protecting them from you know the Massachusetts from courts from taking action against them, uh, from uh, compelling the production of medical rec records, all that sort of thing, are they're very helpful and necessary steps, and that, that the governor and that the Massachusetts legislature are taking. Uh, but uh, you know you still have to have a lot of um, you know lawyers. Uh, to defend against the actions that will come. And I think that they will come, people will try. Um, and then on the um, telehealth issue, um, the, the problem with the way healthcare, one of the problems with the way healthcare is organized in the United States is that you know, all of the licensing um, of healthcare professionals is, is done by the states. And so, um, you know, the basic rule is that a in order to provide health care in a particular state, the physician must be licensed in the state where the patient is. Now, if the patient comes to Massachusetts, that issue in theory goes away. Um, but if the, uh, you know, a provider or a pharmacy sends medication uh, to uh, induce an abortion into the other state, um, you know, that raises this question about licensing. Um, it also raises this question about whether a state actually has within its power mm. to prohibit um, a, a drug approved as safe and effective by the FDA from being used by its citizens in the state for the purpose of inducing an abortion. Now, um, Attorney General Merrick Garland, um, the day Dobbs was decided, announced that the position of the Justice Department was going to be that those laws are unconstitutional. And um, if you have time and you're interested to know, we can get into what the reason is for that. But I think that, um, uh, you know, there, there is a lot of, uh, there is a lot of uh, law and a lot of legal controversy to be resolved as a result of the Stops case. You know what you're saying, Renee and Marjorie, I thought about this when you shared that text with us. 
I'm thinking about, you know, for people who are going to be going, going to get these illegal abortions, if something goes wrong, what does that mean for the landscape of a malpractice lawsuit, for instance, or trying to seek some retribution for that procedure having gone wrong, but then you're also opening up a web of legal ties resulting from that, I imagine. That's if somebody knows about it. That, so exactly. I, so, I, so I, I predict it's all underground, yeah. as it used to be yeah. back in the bad old or days. Or you, you, know? you do think, too, mm -hmm. with the medical abortions, if do, they are very safe and very successful, but if something does go, go wrong, wrong yeah. and you need medical care, does that open you up to arrest? Or if you have right. a miscarriage uh, of a wanted pregnancy, that's quite scary as well, Renee. Yeah, no, so I think, Marjorie, your point is really good that um, um, because of these laws and the possibility of people being prosecuted, it may deter people who need medical assistance because, you know, the, uh, you know, the medication abortion didn't work um, as it usually does uh, or, you know, there were, you know, some unique thing that happened that requires medical assistance. Um, that's a very dangerous thing um, because um, even though... Um, uh, you know, you know, uh, to you know, having laws that actually might deter people from seeking necessary medical care is is, is just really not um, uh, an appropriate thing. The other um, uh, thing that the Dobbs mistake that the Dobbs case makes is that um, it kind of assumes that none of these things ever go wrong in a typical pregnancy, um, but actually the rate of miscarriage is um, is it, you know it's a fairly common event. And um, so if women are afraid of being um, accused of being wrongdoers or their doctors yeah. from providing the standard medical care so that the woman's health is protected in the event of miscarriage, uh, which you know looks a, a, a lot like an abortion, it may in fact be an abortion to protect the woman's health, um, that's a very dangerous situation for women in this country. And the United States already has the highest maternal mortality rate of any developed country in the world, um, which is not a fact to be proud of, and this will only exacerbate that problem. And highest for women of color. Thank yes. you so much, um, Renee Landers, for joining us. Renee thank Landers, thank you very much for having me. Oh, thank great. you, thank you, Renee. Renee Landers is a professor of law and faculty director of the Health and Biomedical Law Concentration and the Masters of Science in Law Life Sciences Program at Suffolk University Law School. Coming up, we look at the state of reproductive rights and abortion access with Rebecca Hart Holder, Executive Director of Reproductive Equity Now. The Community Conversation continues on 89.7 GBH and live on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash GBH News. Broadcasting from our GBH studio at the Boston Public Library. Stay with us. Part of your community. You're going to start to see a lot more ways in which GBH News opens the door to our station to make sure that this is a two-way conversation with the public. We're public media, so this makes sense that this is what we're doing. So we'll be in coffee shops, we'll be in libraries, and most importantly, if you have an idea for where you might want GBH News staff to sit down with a particular group of people, write to me. To contact Annie Schreffler, visit gbhnews.org slash contact. Our programs are made possible thanks to you. And Bunker Hill Community College, offering six-week summer sessions for students looking to get ahead or learn a new skill. The next session starts July 18th. Registration is open, bhcc.edu slash summer. And Hopkinton Center for the Arts, presenting live band concerts Friday and Saturday nights starting at 6.30. Tickets and details on their summer arts series at hopartscenter.org, funded in part by the Massachusetts Office of Travel and Tourism. I'm Paris Austin. Welcome back to Community Conversation, Row Overturned. We're live on 89.7 GBH and streaming on youtube.com slash GBH News. We're broadcasting from our GBH studio at the Boston Public, Li Public Library, and I'm joined by my colleagues Callie Crossley, host of Under the Radar with Callie Crossley, and Marjorie Egan, co-host of Boston Public Radio. Now, if you're just tuning in, we're gathering today to talk through the overturning of Roe v. Wade 
and what it means for the people of Massachusetts. We just spoke with Suffolk University law professor Renee Landers about the legal reverberations of the Supreme Court ruling, and now we're looking at what this means for reproductive rights in Massachusetts and beyond. In 2020, the Massachusetts legislature passed the Roe Act, which removed anti-abortion laws from the books and codified the right to safe, legal abortion. But is there more that the state can do to expand abortion access and reproductive rights in light of the ruling? Joining us to talk through that is Rebecca Hart Holder, Executive Director of Reproductive Equity Now. We also want to hear from you, our audience, your experiences, your reactions to this ruling. We welcome and encourage all points of view, whether you are encouraged or motivated or upset or any of it being along the spectrums of emotions. You can call or text us at 877-301-8970. 877-301-8970, or you can tweet us at GBH News. And if you're here in our live audience at the Boston Public Library, you can ask a question by alerting our colleague, Rebecca Tauber, and there's a mic here for you to come up and speak with us. Rebecca Hart Holder, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So Rebecca, the Massachusetts House passed a bill last night that codifies uh, abortion access and abortion rights in Massachusetts. Why don't you start by giving us your reaction to the passing of that bill? Well, I think most importantly, the Senate acted immediately upon the Dobbs leak with kind of the vehicle that they had available, the budget, and then the House reacted right away as soon as um, Roe was overturned. So I'm, I'm really heartened that there's multiple vehicles moving on Beacon Hill that can, you know, do what we've been calling for, which is to expand access here in the Commonwealth. We're very lucky that we have the legal right codified, but we really do have to work on expanding access to care here. And how would you like to see that happen? One of the most important things that we can tackle right now are protections for providers and patients. So you've probably seen news that the state of Texas, for example, um, is considering legislation where they could try to reach into the Commonwealth and create civil or criminal penalties for abortion providers offering lawful care here in Massachusetts. That is totally unacceptable. We have to make sure that our providers can continue to provide care without fear of civil, criminal penalties, without fear of something happen to, happening to their license, and without fear of implications for their medical malpractice insurance. And so Governor Charlie Baker signed an executive order shortly after the ruling, barring Massachusetts from cooperating with any extradition attempts uh, from other states connected to reproductive care, also protecting providers from professional discipline, um, trying to put some things into place to protect people who might be seeking um, or, or working in this space. Do you think that is enough? Do you think that executive order will put enough of those protections in place? I was really heartened by what the governor did. I have been a critic of his in the past, but um, I wanna call out good action when I see it, but it's not enough. Um, we need to put it in law. Um, the governor also um, left out uh, the fact that they're trying to regulate the provision of gender affirming care as well. It is not a coincidence that the state of Texas went after abortion with SBA and then shortly after that went after healthcare for trans kids. So we have to make sure that that our providers here in the Commonwealth are protected. Um, we also wanna see the legislature strengthen some of the, um, we've been calling it kind of slow rolling. You know, you would have to cooperate with an investigation, but it doesn't mean that, that, um, that our investigative branches here in the Commonwealth have to make it easy to cooperate. Mm -hmm. Can I just, uh, Rebecca, one, just to pick up, uh, what about regular folk? So we are protecting providers in the healthcare industry, but if regular folk help mm -hmm. other people, is there a legal protection that could be codified as well? Yeah, so we, um, in, the, in the Senate language, we talk about kind of, uh, and the kind of layperson's term is the helpers. We talk about all the other people, the abortion funds, you know, the taxi driver, everyone who kind of helps along the way when someone comes into Massachusetts trying to get care, the receptionist at Planned Parenthood or an independent clinic, um, you know, the physician's assistant. We want to make sure that everybody is protected. You know, it's interesting that you raise that, Callie, because I had seen some things circling uh, just on my social media feeds of people who were off in Massachusetts or in other states where abortion 
is still legal, offering their homes, offering to yes. help people and, and, you know, transportation, whatever it may be, or if you donate to an abortion care fund, for instance, could, does all of that fall into that category as well, Rebecca? Yeah, and abortion funds are the people that have been doing this work for decades. They really know how to make sure that folks have the resources they need. And so it was a huge priority for us to make sure that the funds were protected as part of the, um, you know, the provider and patient protections that we're looking at. We got some calls. Yeah, we do. Let's take, <laughs> let's take a call from Dr. K from Fall River. Dr. K, you are on the air. Please go ahead. You're with Rebecca Hartholder and us. Hi there, I'm really happy to hear you guys doing this forum. Thank you. I am somebody who has been working in primary care my entire career, particularly with women's health and with care of the underserved. I feel as though we became a little complacent thinking that we were safe with Roe in place. Those of us who agree to work for the federal government in federally funded health centers who accept the fact that our hands are tied from providing any abortion care to our patients. I just wonder right now with the changing landscape in terms of the federal administration and the way that we're framing the discussions around voting in the midterms and what our legislature looks like for how we um, pass budgets and what we allow to be paid for by federally funded programs, um, whether anything exciting or new is happening in that regard. Rebecca? Yeah, um, you know, I think we saw this, the, advocate, the advocacy community saw very clearly on October 6, 2018, what was coming. And that was the day that Brett Kavanaugh was confirmed to the United States Supreme Court. This is not a shock. Um, this is something that we have been singularly focused on with passage of the Roe Act, with repeal of our pre-Roe criminal abortion ban here in Massachusetts, with expansion of access to contraception. This is the promise of a President Donald Trump, and he delivered. He delivered for people. Um, I, you know, I, I think a lot of people are shocked that Roe fell. Um, you know, there simply has not been the votes in Congress to codify abortion rights. And so, you know, I've been kind of shouting from the rooftops for a long time that we have to be investing in states. That's, you know, the anti-choice movement invested for decades in state legislatures, in state Supreme Courts, in secretaries of state to manipulate voting. We have to be doing the same on our side because the federal government is just simply not coming to save us. So with that, I mean, is the, can the demand, can, can the action meet the demand essentially? Because I guess I'm wondering how quickly, we know in some of these states, they're in those trigger all states, this immediately has gone into effect, some of them are waiting, what, 30 days after the ruling. Some places may take a little longer. Some places will maintain having the right to an abortion. But with things moving so quickly, is the advocacy going to be able to keep up with that? That's a great question. Um, I, you know, I I will say I never thought that we would be we would need the provider protections that in fact we are going to need to keep our providers safe. We have to look at this as a tidal wave. You know, the states that are going to be absorbing patients from states like Missouri and Texas that have outlawed abortion care are the states that border them. But, you know, Illinois uh, is, is projecting that they'll have 20 to 30,000 more patients a year. Their healthcare system simply cannot absorb that number of patients. And so it will begin to spill over to other states where care is legal. If you can get on a flight to Massachusetts, if you have family here, if you have friends here, if you went to school here, you'll come here if you can scrape that money together. So I think you're right. This is, this is an evolution. This is us watching what's happening over the next 12 to 18 months. And and being as nimble as we po possibly can be to make sure that we can get the, the, the safety net in place for folks coming here for care. Marjorie, do we have any Yeah, we have a very in? bleak text from Heather from New Hampshire. And she's talking about how you hear a lot of people that are uh, anti-abortion say they have to step up now with more services for women. Uh, but she says she was had the realization while Renee Landers was talking that they don't really support these things because in her view, they do not want women to be independent. They want them to be home at the mercy of their husbands, having children, popping out children is how she put it, becoming stuck as second class citizens. The very religious and the very misogynist who don't want women to succeed outside the home and force pregnancy will accomplish that. Um, and she basically is talking about what I think a lot of women feel that we have suddenly become 
second-class citizens in the United States of America. We'll talk about this later in the hour, but there is really not an equality anymore between men and women because there is no... Uh, we are the vessels um, mm -hmm. under surveillance. Yeah, look, if, if the federal government was serious about making sure that women had what, what they needed for gender equity, we would have passed paid family medical leave. We would have passed universal pre-K. We would have passed the momnibus, we would have passed the child tax credit and made it permanent, but they haven't been able to do it. So, you know, I hate to say it, but I, I share that, that bleak outlook right now. There is a group of people that want um, misogyny to prevail, that do not want women to be equal. And this is a, overturning Roe is a critical step in, in their plan. Um, Rebecca, all of the studies have shown that the, the people who are using um, because they, for a number of reasons, are going to use abortion services are women of color or um, people, of co people who give birth of, um, of color. Where are we in terms of, given the racial dynamics in this country, I'm just trying to get my head around um, how, that, how that rolls out now, because a number of those women are also low income as well. Mm -hmm. So the the pressure on the systems, they weren't al already, they weren't getting access to uh, a lot of the services that they need, just regular healthcare services, of which reproductive healthcare services are a major part. So what's gonna happen in terms of those kinds of pressures? And how do you see that impacting the racial dynamics that are already fraught in this country? Yeah, there's no doubt that overturning Roe is going to disproportionately impact Black and brown people, indigenous people, low income people, rural folks, you know, people who already have been at a disadvantage when it comes to access to services. Something I'm really concerned about is that some of our colleagues in Texas who run abortion funds have stopped providing funds for people because of the threat from Governor Abbott that they will be prosecuted mm -hmm. for helping um, for helping with abortion care. I, I, you know, I do not see a way forward that doesn't result in much more health care inequality. The fact of the matter is that if you have the resources to spend time trying to get through to an abortion fund whose phone lines are just overwhelmed right now with people who are scared and angry and who don't want to be pregnant and don't know what to do, it means that, you know, you already have the time off to spend the time on the phone, and then you're gonna be able to get yourself to a place like New York, Massachusetts, Illinois, California. But if you're a shift worker, if you don't have childcare, if you don't have family that can help you, if you don't have a little bit of savings, you know, it's gonna be very hard to get that in-person care. I mean, that is why we really have to increase um, access to medication abortion and get that into people's hands early. But, but frankly, this, isn't, this, is a, this is a public health crisis for communities of color. Some have just flatly said women will die. What do you say? Women will die. And we can get women access to abortion care through medication abortion, and we have to do that quickly. We cannot let the United States Postal Service be regulated by states. We have to ensure that people can get the mail so that they can get medication abortion. You know, Rebecca, I'm thinking about um, some of our GBH colleagues, Hannah Rialli and Megan Smith, have done some reporting on medication abortion and how it's even hard to get it to places like Nantucket <laughs> and Martha's Vineyard. So let alone getting it to other states. I mean, wh what what is there to be done there? Yeah, you know, there are several pharmacies that work nationwide getting medication abortion to folks when they need it. Telehealth is going to be an incredibly important option, but I don't want to sugarcoat it. There are people that are not going to get access because it's going to be more difficult to get on that telehealth platform because pharmacies, you know, as states like Texas and Missouri try to regulate access to medication abortion will be afraid about their liability. Um, in, in, in mailing uh, pills. There is an organization um, that uh, is overseas that I think saw an 800% increase in requests coming out of Texas after SB8 for medication abortion pills. So there will be people working overseas, but um, hard to imagine that it doesn't have a profound impact on the healthcare system. 
We're talking to Rebecca Hartholder, who's the executive director of Reproductive Equity Now. As part of our community conversation, Roe overturned. And we also want to continue hearing from you, your experiences, your reactions to the ruling. You can call us or text us at 877-301-8970. That's 877-301-8970. Or tweet us at GBH News. And a reminder to our audience here at the Boston Public Library, please, if you have a question or a comment, just wave down our colleague, Rebecca Tauber. I think she, she might have been headed to the bathroom, but she's walking back this way. <laughs> but, and the microphone is she's right back. here. She's back. She's back. She's back. So you could wave her down. Or Bessie from Rochester is on the phone. Bessie, thank you for calling. Oh, absolutely. I just want to say, as a retired clinician, I don't think this is the final ball that's going to drop. Hmm. I believe that we will find a workaround and give women the right to choose. Unfortunately, being able to overturn a ruling of a prior Supreme Court justice court, well then what does it matter what decision they make today or tomorrow? Because they've set the rule now, you can change anything you want, pending political or social issues, and not uphold the Constitution or any ruling. Do they know they just shot themselves in the foot? Rebecca, do you have a response to that? Yeah, I, I don't think I. Um, I don't think I share the caller's faith in the ability to create workarounds. I think there are states that are just just dead set on um, controlling um, women and pregnant people's bodies, and um, they are they you know they are they're gerrymandered. It's hard for people to vote. It is going to be very hard to unseat the politicians in those states who, um, you know, who who just are, are going to stand in the way of access to health care. You know, Chris from Boston also raised a very good point about uh, child abuse, which is a very serious problem in, in the United States and around the world. And uh, Chris is concerned that it, uh, whose sister works with child abuse uh, survivors, it, it seems like cases are more frequent uh, based on her call time. This is the sister's call time. And Chris says, I can't imagine about the frequency and severity of child abuse cases that they might be become even more horrible if a woman is who cannot deal with the pregnancy either because she's poor, she has other children she can't take care of, or she doesn't have the, uh, the she's not able at this stage in her life to, to become a mother. Um, as Chris put it, if she cannot follow her heart and is forced to uh, finish a pregnancy. Well, I don't know about you all, but um, I, I grew up with a number of kids who were not wanted. Mm -hmm. And the contrast from my house to theirs, I was so lucky is shocking and horrible, and it's nothing worse to see. Um, so, you know, I want parents to want to have those children. Yeah, yeah, Rebecca, Rebecca do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I, you know, I, there is a study from UCSF uh, called the Turnaway Study that talks about what happens to people when they are not able to get the um, abortion care that they want. It's a longitudinal study, so there's, there's, I think, nearly a decade of data. And what we know is that people have, you know, worse economic outcomes. Um, they're more likely to suffer, suffer mental health issues. Um, I do also know that, that, that women are resilient, and we have been fighting back for decades and hundreds of years, and we will continue to fight. But, but the impact on, on people and families is very real. And I think it's, um, it's really shameful what the court has done to try to turn back the clocks. And, and just to note that, you know, there are all sorts of factors that go into a person or a family's decision to, to have a right. child, to bring a new, a new life uh, into theirs. And Rebecca, I'm also wondering, I mean, when we talk about this, where you're going to bring a child into the world or not, there's all kinds of things financially, emotionally, mentally that go into that. And I guess I'm just wondering, too, what it, how would you describe the infrastructure we have, both in Massachusetts and beyond, to support childbearing people, be they mothers, parents in general? I mean, when we talk about, you mentioned not having paid family medical leave in place in a way that would make people feel comfortable 
structuring their lives around parenthood. I talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, and, and I'll talk as a as a parent of two girls myself. So, you know, we're really lucky that in Massachusetts we have paid family medical leave. I think that's critical for um, for parents and caregivers. Um, we don't have universal pre-K. Um, I know that that's something that the Massachusetts Senate is talking about taking up today. I think that's an absolutely critical piece of making um, folks able to parent. Um, we also have some of the highest um, out-of-pocket deductibles for um, prenatal care, for all pregnancy care. And that's something that we have been raising um, with the legislature that, you know, for regardless of the kind of um, pregnancy care that you need, whether it's pre and postnatal care, labor and delivery, miscarriage management or abortion care, the cost of that care can be prohibitive and it can prevent you from getting that care earlier. And so we want to make sure that you have the kind of structural support that you need to make whatever decision um, is right for you. We have a question here from an audience member. Forum. It's really helpful to have this, to have a place to come talk about it. I have two different questions. One is we're focusing all of this on the women, which we need to do, but what do we, how are we talking to the men who are creating part of this problem? <laughs> Great no point. One is, no one is addressing that. And, you know, there are so many thoughts out there, but what can we actually do? So that's the first question. And the second question is, does HIP, do HIPAA laws um, protect people if they need, say, a DNC, and why something would be needed and medication. Mm -hmm. I think we should nail those fathers and make sure they pay <laughs> for the moment yeah. the baby's born. <laughs> the kid is 21 years old. I mean, it's amazing that no one. Where is where? Everybody knows in their life, fathers were not supporting their children, right? In Massachusetts, we're better than other places, but we're not great either. Um, you know? and, yeah, and I mean, so often we we limit our conversation about reproductive care to yes. women, right? When we know that there has been there have been conversations about male birth control, all sorts of other ways to not put all of that on uh, the person who would be carrying a child. In many instances, who's a woman, right? Um, because we also talk about people who who bear children um, of other gender identifying communities. But yeah, I mean, Marjorie, it's funny because I immediately looked at you because I know that. This is something you talk about on BPR. Yeah, there's a certain amount of hostility there that, is, that there's not real tough child support laws and there's not real uh, sharing of the costs of, of childbearing. And I, but I don't know the answer on the... I, I will the say this. That'll make you just more depressed. Oh. Uh, Renee Landers, that we just knew, who we just spoke to, had, uh, has for years, I don't know if she continues to have a question on one of her tests for her students. Um, and it's about what a yeah, scenario in which the woman is pregnant and what happens. It's a, you know, a legal situation. And she says, pretty much without fail, few people say, well, what about the father? Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so inbred mm -hmm. exactly. in how we think. So maybe it's just a massive beginning to rethink. Well. And Rebecca, I don't know if you know the answer to the question about the DNC, which is the procedure that many women who have miscarriages go, go through, which is similar to an abortion. I mean, what about the, the HIPAA laws? Do we know? Yeah, well, I think the question was, does HIPAA protect our privacy if we are, in fact, getting abortion care? And certainly it does. It does. That is not something that folks need to worry about. What you do need to worry about is data protection. So if you're Googling abortion clinic, if you're... Um, you know, if you're Googling unintended pregnancy, your period tracker app, um, we do need to be really careful about what we're putting out uh, on the internet. And say more, a little bit more about that, Rebecca, because does that mean, I mean, what do you use incognito windows? Do you delete that period, track, period tracking app? Like what exactly? And does deleting it, delete it forever? Exactly, is yeah. it on the cloud? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the answer is deleting it does not delete it forever. Um, but certainly using incognito mode, we are working I and mean, we are just playing, we're drinking from the fire hose right now and data protections are one of the things that we are trying to figure out so that we can make sure folks searching for abortion care here in Massachusetts are not having their data sold um, mm -hmm. to brokers so that they could be targeted. Wow. Yeah. Marjorie, do we have a- Yes, squeeze Lisa in, a in Boston is on the phone. Hi, Lisa. So I- I'm loving this discussion. I appreciate what you're doing. And I don't know if we can somehow take the religion, take the politics, even take the facts out of it because people don't agree. But I think it's 
as a woman, it's very frustrating that somebody is telling me to put my health at risk. I mean, we can all agree that women are the ones who get pregnant. They're the ones that carry the child. And there are risks involved with that. And unless these people who are pro-life are willing to make a law that says, let's say Jim Browdy needs a kidney to live, and Brett Kavanaugh is a perfect match. If I need to be told by law, I have to risk my well-being to have an unborn child. Is it that much of a leap to say, you know what, Jim Browdy needs to give up a kidney for hmm. Brett Kavanaugh? I don't see that happening. <laughs> you know, I can't, I mean, if you take out hmm. all of the religion yeah. and politics, yeah. to true. me, that's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Re Re Rebecca, yeah. I'd love to give you a chance to respond to that. Yeah, I, a really important point is that most people of faith are pro-choice. And actually, this is not a divisive political issue. If you look at the data and you look at the polling, just in Massachusetts, we did a poll. And, you know, almost 75% of Catholic people um, believe that Roe should be codified. This is a winning political issue. Nobody lost their seat in the Massachusetts legislature because of their vote on the Roe Act. It, it's actually not as divisive as we think, but it has been exploited by a minority that is obsessed with power and control. And so I, I totally agree with Lisa that we need to be in control of our own bodies, but I don't want, I, I don't want to feed the narrative that this is divisive because it's actually not. Rebecca Hart Holder is the Executive Director of Reproductive Equity Now. Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My pleasure. Coming up, we will take a look at how Massachusetts is positioned to respond to the growing demand of people seeking abortion access and reproductive care as states across the country move to ban or restrict access. Our community conversation continues here at the Boston Public Library on 89.7 GBH and live on our YouTube channel, which is at youtube.com slash GBH News. Please stay with us. Join GBH News on YouTube for stories, conversations, and trusted local news. Subscribe today at youtube.com slash GBH News. Support for our programs comes from you and the Boston Public Market in downtown Boston, offering fresh, regionally sourced food, prepared meals, and specialty items from 30 local farmers and artisans. This message funded by the Massachusetts Office of Travel and Tourism. Discover how North Adams, Massachusetts, transitioned from a small town in economic collapse to become part of the global art world in just a few decades. Don't miss Museum Town, tonight at 9 on GBH2. I'm reporter Craig Lamolt, and this is 89.7 WGBH, WGBH HD1 Boston, online at gbhnews.org. Boston's local NPR. I'm Marjorie Egan. Welcome back to Community Conversation Row Overturn. We are live on 89.7 GBH, and we are streaming on youtube.com slash GBH News, broadcasting for our GBH studio at the Boston Public Library. I am joined by my colleagues Callie Crossley of Under the Radar with Callie Crossley and Paris Alston, co-host of the morning show on, on GBH. What's the name of the morning show? Morning Edition. Thank you very much. <laughs> morning Edition. <laughs> Every morning, and she gets up very early to get there and do that job. We're talking talking through what the overturning of Roe v. Wade means for the people of Massachusetts. And we've looked at this from a legal and legislative angle. Now we're focusing on access to abortions and reproductive care. Supreme Court ruling is expected to lead to abortion bans in roughly half the states in America, making Massachusetts a comparably safe haven for people in search of an abortion, uh, with abortion care providers anticipating the influx of people if coming to Massachusetts for the kind of care they can no longer get elsewhere, where are we ready to provide that kind of care and how can we provide it? So joining us on the line to talk about this is somebody who knows everything about this. She's Carrie Baker. Uh, she's a professor of the study of women and gender at Smith College. She also works with the Plan. Parenthood Advocacy Fund and the Abortion Fund in Western Massachusetts. Thank you so much, Carrie Baker, for being with us uh, to share your expertise. We also want to tell people you can still call. We've got another half hour of this to go. You can call us at 877-301-8970, or uh, you can 
text us at that very same number or tweet us at GBH News. You know, Carrie Baker, I said you know everything about this because you've written so much about uh, uh, abortion, but I wanted to put this in kind of a perspective of your academic uh, perspective. You know, you, you study gender, law policy, and feminist social movements. This is not particularly a moment of a feminist social movement going forward, but, but where do you see this in terms of gender relations, equality between the genders? after this Supreme Court decision? I actually think this Supreme Court decision threatens most of the gains that women have made over the last 50 years. If you look at the reasoning of the court, what they said is that if a right is not explicit in the Constitution, if it wasn't intended by the guys back in 1868 who adopted the 14th Amendment, and if there's not a long history of that right being established, then you don't have the right. And Quite frankly, you know, the guys weren't thinking about women in 1868, and women didn't have many rights back then. And so I think that the reasoning of Dobbs could be used to underline a whole range of women's rights, like, for instance, Griswold versus Connecticut, which guaranteed access to contraception. And the, the later case that was a Massachusetts case, Eisenstadt versus Baird, which guaranteed single people the right to contraception. I think this decision could undermine women's equality rights under the Equal Protection Clause because the Equal Protection Clause passed in 1868 was not intended to protect women. That was a later interpretation. And, you know, Scalia, who used to be on the court, said that the Equal Protection Clause wasn't meant to protect women from discrimination. So, you know, I, I think that this, this decision really undermines a lot of women's gains from the last 50 years and that we really need to be pushing back. We really need to, quite frankly, fight for the Equal Rights Amendment, which the Trump administration blocked. Well, talk about that. We have a big advocate, Wendy Murphy, who's worked very tirelessly for years yeah. on the Equal Rights Amendment here in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Talk about that in relationship to uh, the Roe decision. Yeah, so... One very striking thing about the Dobbs decision was that Alito referenced a 1974 decision called Gedoldig versus ALO, and it involved a California disability plan that excluded pregnancy. And at the time, feminists sued and said, well, it's sex discrimination if it, if it excludes pregnancy, because mostly it's women who get pregnant. And the Supreme Court said, no, it's not discriminating against women. It only discriminates between pregnant people and non-pregnant people. And that decision was absurd at the time. The Supreme Court um, did a, a similar case in an employment discrimination context under Title VII. It was called GE versus Geduldig. And in that case, the Supreme Court um, was overruled by Congress. They passed the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, right? So we're protected with that act. But the Gedoldig decision was never overturned, and, the, and Alito cited that decision to say, don't think you're going to get abortion rights by arguing that it violates women's equality. And so, you know, we, the Equal Rights Amendment, which, you know, Trump blocked, is a potential new way that we could, because it's a new amendment to the Constitution, that we could argue that banning abortion disproportionately impacts women and therefore it violates women's equal opportunity to participate in the workforce and in education and therefore we need to, um, you know, striking down any abortion bans on those grounds. You know, Carrie Baker, you've also investigated how far women may have to travel right here in Massachusetts to get abortion care and how it's, it, many, if not all of our state schools, uh, young women there are cannot get so-called abortion uh, pills to induce an abortion. Uh, um, I always mispronounce them, so I'm not going to try. But I, they can't get those at their schools. They have to travel miles to get those. So give us the update there. Yeah, so I did research. So none of the 13 public university campuses in Massachusetts offer abortion pills. They could. It's very easy. It doesn't take any special technology. They could give those to people, but they don't. And so I did research trying to determine what kind of burden does that impose on college students in Massachusetts and determined that women and people who can get pregnant have to travel long distances to get to the nearest abortion clinic. I'll give you an example of University of Massachusetts of Amherst out here where I live. It 
it's 24 miles to get to the nearest abortion clinic in Springfield from the University of Massachusetts campus. Round trip, that's uh, 48 miles on a public transportation that takes two hours and 18 minutes one way. And 79% of students at UMass don't have cars. And so you're basically making people take a whole day to ride the bus all the way into Springfield, get the pill they need, and then go back to the campus when in fact you could just offer it right on campus. So our representative out here, Lindsay Sabadosa, has introduced legislation to require public university health centers to offer abortion pills. And this is really important because post row, when abortion is no longer available in many parts of the country and people flock to Massachusetts from other states, waiting periods are gonna get longer. It's gonna be harder to get the care we need. So we need more providers offering these pills. And college university health centers are a great place to start. Carrie, I have a question for you from Brian from Southboro. Go ahead, Brian, mm -hmm. you're on with us and with Carrie Baker. Hey, thank you. Um, so my partner and I, we live in Massachusetts. We also have a place in Maine. And there were two gay guys. We, we want to contribute. Um, is there a website that we can uh, go to to kind of put our names in to be um, kind of a host for people coming in who need an abortion but can't pay for hotels or anything like that? Um, is, is there something that we could you know, offer our, our name up to? Great so question, Brian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is, um, if somebody wanted to host somebody coming from out of state, um, how, do you, how do you do that? So I would suggest that you contact the abortion rights funds in Massachusetts. There's three of them. There's the Abortion Rights Fund of Western Massachusetts out here. There's Emma, the Emma Fund in Boston. And then there's the Jane Fund in Worcester. So depending on where you live, those are three funds. There's also another one called Tides for Women. It's a new fund and they're focusing in particular on housing. Um, nationally, there's a group called the Bridget Alliance that focuses on helping people get housing. I think primarily they raise money for people to pay for hotel rooms, but um, they certainly are a good organization if you're interested in helping people traveling from out of state. You know, we want to talk in a second about a little more about what we can do about this if you are trying to restore abortion rights. But I, I think one of the things that, about Massachusetts that people should know, and, and you talked about uh, just, Justice Alito referring to unborn human beings repeatedly in his, in his decision, that there is a possibility of a Republican Congress and a Republican president voting personhood into law in the United States of America, which would override uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, yeah, I believe it would override uh, our abortion laws here and outlaw abortion all across the country. Yeah, when I read the opinion and saw that he used that phrase, unborn human beings, so many times, what I became concerned about is that he was teeing up a challenge to abortion laws like in the state of Massachusetts that protect the right to abortion. And here's what the argument would be. Unborn human beings have full 14th Amendment protections. Uh, abortion violates the right to life of unborn human beings and therefore is unconstitutional. And the Supreme Court could definitely do that. I don't know if you saw this, but just about an hour ago, President Biden announced that we need to get rid of the filibuster yes. to pass a federal law protecting abortion rights. I think that's a wonderful sign. He's been very resistant to getting rid of the filibuster. He spent so many years in the Senate and very much believes in the rules of the Senate. But I think that he realizes that we are really at a critical time. We have got to get rid of the filibuster. We have to pass the Women's Health Protection Act, which is a federal law that would protect abortion rights in all 50 states. Now, the Supreme court could still strike that down uh, if they said unborn human beings have the right to life and therefore those laws violate the constitution that's why i think we also need to expand the supreme court add four more seats and so that biden could balance out the court because the court is unnaturally skewed towards the conservative right because mitch mcconnell stole that seat for merrick garland in 2016 right at the end of um uh, the last, you know, presidency, Obama's presidency, and then, of course, rushed through the Amy Coney Barrett nomination at the very end of Trump's um, presidency. So I really think that to right that wrong, we need to add seats on the Supreme Court. 
Um, I just wanted to follow up uh, your comment about President Biden. Uh, I thought it was rather significant as well when he mentioned that he would be willing to consider removing the, the filibuster uh, in order to move legislation on um, protecting abortion rights. However, there have been two, now, admitted, we've been, you know, it's been a week or so, so we're still in the processing, but there have been two polls, one national, one in Massachusetts. The question has been asked, is this an issue that will drive you to the polls, that mm. will make you think hard about who you support? And the answer has been, nah, not at the top of my list. Maybe that changes, but I wonder, Carrie Baker, how you, how you react to that. To, you, you're talking about the issue of abortion? Yes. They, so, they, in, in the national poll and in the poll in Massachusetts, it's not enough to drive me, to, to make me vote, uh, to drive me, to motivate me to vote, rather. Yeah. So I think it depends on what groups you're looking at. Young people, it absolutely is a will drive young people to the polls. Young people are the people that have the most at stake with abortion rights. They're still in their reproductive ages. So I think that maybe if you look overall, maybe that's true. Although I think that it, you know, I think that from my, from what I've seen of the polls, it is something that will drive people to the polls. But I know that if you look specifically at young people, and that is a group that only votes at about 20%. And I know that the advocacy groups that I work with are really focusing on college students and young people mm -hmm. to get them in the votes, to vote. And particularly in, there's eight key states that Democrats need to focus on. There's four states where we need to keep Democrats, and that would be uh, Warnock in Georgia, uh, Maggie Hassan in New Hampshire, Mark Kelly in Arizona, and Catherine Cortez Masto in Nevada. And then there's four states where we have a shot at gaining Democratic seats. That's John Fetterman in Pennsylvania, Tim Ryan in Ohio, Cherry Lynn Beasley in North Carolina, and um, Sarah um, in Wisconsin. Sarah, and I forget, I'm forgetting her name right now, um, but... Um, Sarah Godlewski. And so if we can pick up two more seats in the Senate and overcome the filibuster after the midterm elections, then we can not only pass abortion rights, but we can pass voting rights, the ERA, and many other right, gun rights, immigration rights, climate change. There is so much that is absolutely critical. If we focus, like young voters absolutely care about climate change and gun laws in addition to reproductive rights. We need to reach out to, we, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of Democrats and abortion rights supporters. We need to reach out to those young people and educate them about these issues and how we can really make a difference if we can just pick up two more people in the Senate and also of course maintain the House. Here's a story from a, a texter. I was 32 years old, married, financially stable, wanting a baby. When my fetus died at 12 weeks, I spent two days trying to expel the dead fetus. Finally went to my physician who offered me a DNC or the option of going home to wait. I chose the DNC, thankfully, because by the time I got on the table at the hospital, my blood pressure was so low, the nurse took away the pillow under my head and would not let me sit up for three hours. Had I gone home alone, I might have had a stroke before my husband got home from work. The whole process might have turned turned septic and killed me. So she said she wants these men making these laws to understand what it feels like to expel a failed fetus mm -hmm. and what it feels like to go through an experience like this. Uh, I'm sure you've heard stories like this before. Uh, Carrie Baker, what do you think? Well, I make the argument that banning abortion is most dangerous for people who have wanted pregnancies and when they're trying to carry the pregnancies to term. You know, People that want abortions are probably, a lot of them are gonna get abortion pills, which are extremely safe. Um, you know, it will definitely harm some people, but I think many more people carry pregnancies to term than get abortions each year. And those are the people that are most gonna be at risk because of these bans, because of exactly the kinds of thing you're talking about. Doctors will be afraid to do miscarriage care. They will be afraid to help women who are in crisis, who are bleeding, who are separate, because if there's still a fetal heartbeat or it's still cardiac, cardiac activity, they're going to worry that they will be criminally prosecuted. In Texas, you could end up in jail for 10 years for doing an abortion and just having to prove that, oh, it was, her life was on the line. Many of these 
life exceptions to these abortion bans are very narrow and very difficult to prove. Oh, you know, her life was on the line. I have a friend who's a, um, a psychiatrist, a um, gynecological psychiatrist in Texas, and she said that they are sending women who are hemorrhaging home. They are sending women home whose um, sacs have have pierced. You know, the her um, the sac that the in, that the um, fetus is in has broken, but because there's still a fetal heartbeat, they can't treat them. Oh. So they send them home and say, wait until there's an infection, and then we can treat you. We're talking with Carrie Baker. She's a professor of the study of women and gender at Smith College. We have a a, 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 a live chat stream question from Irene. And you've written about this, the impact of these laws on IVF, uh, in vitro fertilization, mm -hmm. which is quite mm -hmm. common in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts because our insurance covers it here. Yeah, absolutely. So I think this decision definitely endangers IVF because IVF often entails creating embryos that you either don't use or that you have to remove once they're implanted. You know, the, the folks that are against abortion are also against stem cell research and any sort of scientific process that entails the potential destruction of fertilized eggs or embryos. By the way, I think this decision also endangers contraception. If yes. you remember the Hobby Lobby case from a yes. few years mm -hmm. ago, Hobby Lobby objected to several forms of contraception, saying that they thought it was abortificence, things like IUDs or emergency contraception. And, you know, what's to stop the states from saying, well, we believe this is an abortion, so you can no longer get emergency contraception. You can no longer get IUDs. Folks in the anti-abortion movement, some think that all hormonal contraception can have abortificent effects. And so I think some states could potentially try to ban all forms of hormonal contraception. And that, to me, is really, really worrying. You know, you know Carrie, as you're just, sorry, Marjorie, do we oh, have no, another question? I was just saying, as Carrie was describing all of that, um, I'm thinking about conversations that we've had about you, Marjorie and Callie, having lived at a time where Roe wasn't, where the constitutional right to abortion was not protected, and then it was. I, being of a different generation and having always lived in a time where it was, and now suddenly we are having, we're doing this shift, right? Not necessarily in Massachusetts, but nationwide. Um, my peers and I, and just, I guess I'm wondering, like, both, what what was it like to witness that shift and how is some of the stuff that Carrie is saying and describing and that we're hearing, are you worried about returning to that? But then also, Carrie, are we ready for that? Do you think people are getting that this is going to become reality again for some people? Well, you know, I was, uh, this was a situation for when I was grown. I don't remember people in like high school or college or anything mm -hmm. if that it, I'm sure it probably happened but I don't remember that but in when I was grown and grown folks were trying to make decisions about their lives uh, some made a decision um, after bad experiences um, some were, I'm talking really bad like rape um, um, and then others because it was just really the wrong they were not prepared to care for a child and it was a lot of agony on their part to make the decision, but it absolutely made a difference in terms of the rest of their lives. It just did. Um, I'm very distressed that in this conversation, the fact that there are so many of these laws that don't even take into account rape and incest or that mental trauma, the depths of it that people have. So to force someone to carry to term, um, the product of that is really horrific because again, I you know, know people who've had to suffer that. It's, it's really scary. And so a lot of people, you know, again, underground, underground kinds of tactics because they were determined to get it done. And it, you know, before it was legal and then afterwards, it was still agonizing when it was legal. It's mm. not, this is not something people just do cavalierly. Mm -hmm. I think that mm -hmm. needs to be understood. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, this gets back to the gender yeah. issue. You know, I heard Asa Hutchinson, the governor of Arkansas, on television the other morning, and someone asked him about exactly that. What happens, I think it was Chuck Todd, actually, I meet the press. What happens if a 13-year-old uh, is carrying the incestuous child of her father? Mm -hmm. What happens? And Hutchinson says, well, you know, I, I would prefer it weren't that way, but that's kind of the way it goes. Mm. And I just thought, how can anybody think like this? This is where the whole, um, 
the the misogyny and the yeah. and the lack of care for women and the status of women that you've written about and studied extensively, Carrie Baker, just kind of hits you over the head. Yeah, yeah I, I think we all need to remember we live in a society that's rampant with sexual violence. And you know, while obviously many cases of sexual violence, people don't end up pregnant, but in many cases they do. And to me, and one thing I've argued in my own writing is that sexual violence and forced pregnancy are two sides of the same coin. And that coin is misogyny. It's a disrespect of women's bodily autonomy, of the right to determine who comes into their body and who doesn't and when. And they're both forms of violence. Uh, it, abortion bans, I believe, are a form of violence. It, it leads to, I mean, particularly for black women, in the state of Mississippi, childbirth is 75 times more dangerous than abortion. I get that quote from the dissent in the Dobbs decision. Yep. 75 times more dangerous. Mississippi is a state that's done nothing to lower their really high maternal mortality rate that falls disproportionately on black women. And by the way, infant mortality rate too, which falls disproportionately on black babies. They don't seem to care about that. They're not putting policies in place to address that, but they're banning abortion to make that problem worse. And so I really have to question, what is the motivation of these people? You know, they're not about protecting babies. No. They're not, they're certainly not about protecting women. And, you know, I argue in my writing, and this is a whole nother part, but I really think it's about white supremacy. They want more white babies and then they'll suppress the votes of black people. And then the white people, as they become more and more of a minority, will be able to maintain political power. And again, I've studied the history of this issue, and that may be kind of shocking for people to hear me say that, but there's a lot of really incredible scholarship showing how closely aligned the anti-abortion movement is with white supremacy. Carrie Baker from Smith College, we only have a couple of minutes left, so let's try to leave this on a hopeful note. What can we do? So one thing I would say is get out and vote in the fall elections and volunteer in those eight states I mentioned, send your money to those candidates, uh, do text banking, travel down to those states if you can, um, uh, go down to Georgia and work with Raphael Warnock uh, and Stacey Abrams, who's amazing. And But I would also say, I do a lot of writing on abortion pills. The fact of the matter is, is that folks can easily order abortion pills online and have them mailed to their homes. And there's a great organization called plancpills.org and you can learn more about how to order abortion pills. They're safer than Tylenol. You can get them online from abroad for $109, sliding scale fee through aidaccess.org. So this is today's underground abortion movement. It's ordering pills by mail. Pre-row, you didn't have the internet. You didn't have abortion pills. Women were filling, filling emergency rooms, septic and hemorrhaging. That's not gonna happen post row because of abortion pills, but we need to get the word out there and we need to get the pills in people's hands. So I really, I encourage everybody, you should be tweeting and sharing on Facebook information, plancpills.org and aid access. Are you, are you hopeful before you go? Do you think we're gonna be able to get over this? Return this to what it's it was? It's a hard fight. Okay. Our country is in a state of crisis. Our democracy is in a state of crisis. All hands on deck right now. We all need to be fighting for voting rights, for abortion rights, for all the things that we're losing now. Well, Carrie Baker, thank you so much for joining us. We much appreciate your time. Carrie Baker is a professor of the study of women and gender at Smith College. She also works with the Planned Parenthood Advocacy Fund and the Abortion Fund in Western Massachusetts. Thank you all for joining us today uh, to our special coverage of the abortion issue at the end of Roe v. Wade. For ongoing coverage, keep your dial on 89.7, and you can also stream us at gbhnews.org. Follow us on GBH2, Greater Boston uh, weeknights as well. Uh, thank you very much to Callie Crossy, who was with us from uh, the Callie Crossy Show, and from Paris, Austin. Give us the name of the morning <laughs> show. I, I don't have it in front of me, and I morning forgot the edition. name. Morning, morning edition. edition. Boy, that's a tough one to remember, <laughs> <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Anything you want to say? We have like a minute left. Anything you'd like to add, ladies? Uh, I would just say thank you to everyone who texted, called, came up to the mic, and gave your input. You asked your questions. We appreciate it. 
I would say that the conversation continues. This is not a one and done conversation. And uh, so folks could, should continue to send in comments and thoughts and, and call I, in. And I would like to say we were overwhelmed with texts and phone calls. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but I do appreciate uh, everyone who texted and called and for the people that came down to the Boston Public Library uh, to join us. I'm Marjorie Egan. Thank you again for joining us today and keep the fight going. I'm Kelly Boston.